Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We will call this work session to order, and thank you for being here this morning. Public comment. Do we have public comment this morning? Yes, we only have three people. All right. Uh, we respect our citizens' rights to express their opinions. However, I intend to enforce our three-minute rule this morning, so please be aware once you reach your three minutes, I will uh, politely ask you to please wrap your sentence up and the floor will be taken back by me. Please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against personnel or officials which should be handled in another forum other than the body uh, of this such. Uh, next, uh, the first person on the list is Mr. Jack Baggett. And I believe Wanda Spires is with you. Mr. Jack Baggett, please come to the podium, please. And state your name again and your Thank address. You. I thought I was third. Oh, you did. But no, you first today. You first. I'm here at Imperity Most you all know that. I'm here about a problem with an employee and also about a building permit. James Worthington said that I stood on my property out there and I got five witnesses to say that we will issue a, a permit on that building been started when I had a heart attack and I quit building. And every time he told us we'd come up and get a permit. My son went up out to get a permit and wanted to verify this. There's five people sitting there he did say he had issued a permit. Raise your hand if he did. And then he turned around and said we had to get another site plan. Now that's three site plans. I fought this country against dictatorship, and I see it right here. All right, and then he said I had to hire a contractor. I'm, been, I'm licensed anywhere in the state of Georgia. That's a federal law. I'm a death veteran. And my son been a builder too. So we hired a contractor. And it cost us about $10,000. All right, he went down there and they sat down with him. And this contractor had to sign the foundation and all was okay. So we did that. I'm not here to cause him trouble. I'm very dis hurt and disappointed. The man signed it. So my son ordered the pre-engineer steel buildings are pre-approved. That building is sitting in that warehouse, costing us money. Now if we bring that building out there and put it on the ground, the state of thieves will steal it. And it's sad that we live in the county. I've been here all my life. I built buildings probably 50. And I've never had this kind of problem. And it makes me so upset that I can't say, I'm 84 years old, I'm legally a death veteran. And I fought against dictatorship. One starts something, the other and follow it up. And this ain't right. But what do you do when a man does what a paid employee does what he wants to, with no control? If he don't have a reason, he makes up a reason. And I want this investigated. And I won't quit till it is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bagger. We'll take this uh, matter under advisement. And I will ask our county administrator Work, and you director. Are the biggest liar I ever seen. All right, next we have on the uh, list is Mr. Wanda Spikes, are you speaking? Spires, is yes. Wanda Spires coming for you? Spires? Okay. Please give us your name again and your address, Ms. Spires. Okay, Wanda Spires, 8570 Andy Mountain Court, Villarica, Georgia. Yes, ma'am. I'm here as a friend of the family and we have been waiting over two weeks the friend of the family of ma'am friend of the family of mr baggett or? mr baggett's yes, family okay they have been having problems trying to get this building up they've ordered the <coughs> building now they're having to pay rent to store the building mm -hmm. we've got a letter that was uh, okay the driveway 2001 
where it was approved. We've got five buildings on that property, and now we can't do anything till the DOT approves it. And we've got a letter saying the driveway is approved. So all we need now is to get the DOT to approve the driveway so we can get a building permit so they won't have to keep paying rent on a building that they've ordered. And the people are telling him if he don't get things together that they're not going to build the building. He's done paid them. So he's losing all the way around. And I appreciate y'all listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Spires. We'll take this matter under advisement. And last but not least, we have Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, please come forward and state your address. And the subject matter today is good and bad. Is that your subject matter? Let's give us your address again, please. Good morning, Madam Chair and fellow councilmen. My name's Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Well, I put down <clears throat> good and bad because the good is I'm not talking about the corner. The bad is I'm going to speak with a forked tongue. I know we've all heard that growing up, but the forked tongue is actually to help you. I'm here to speak for the Board of Commissioners to understand what's going on on number four, which will be tomorrow night, okay? Now, I don't know, very few people get concerned or give a hoot, as they say, if they don't live in an area where the bees are swarming. But it just so happens I have a friend that's going to manufacture something for me in Hiram. So the past two weeks, I deliberately went one way and I went another way. <coughs> what the people are going to be raising came tomorrow night about is the route in which Mr. <coughs> Valentin and Georgia DOT said, let's go. Now, there's things that were not mentioned. And I assure you, when I drive my van, I notice them. So if you go up here, the burnt hickory, the road that goes parallel to the graystone. Cross over the tracks, go through the industrial intersection, go to the next one. You meander on out, cross the bridge, and you finally get to Brownsville Road. Now at Brownsville Road, you have a determination to make. If you go right, <coughs> you're going to Powder Springs. If you go left, you can meander around and it dead ends in the 92 by the grocery store. But if you go straight across into Paulding County, it's a well-traveled road. <clears throat> go on around, follow it on around, and there's only one major stop sign. It's a three-way stop sign in front of Travis Tritt's corner property. You can tell his property because the chain link fence for him is black for a mile and then it turns to the right. Now, what the people are going to fuss about is two things, and I went both directions. It takes exactly 15 minutes to come from the grocery store to Graystone, hitting 78. It takes about 20 minutes if you go Travis Tritt, it's a little longer, but you can go faster. And there's hardly any hills. Now the hills and the whippy doos and all this and the subdivisions and the roads coming out into the road is from the grocery store route coming around on Burnt Hickory. So this is what you've got to consider. What the people are fussing about, semi-trucks and all coming down a certain road. And if you think truck drivers or semi-drivers pay attention to signs, come out and sit on my swing on Van Sant Road and see how many cut through Van Sant Road instead of going to the end of the road. Doesn't matter. So as I said before, if you've got to hire an off-duty, give a few tickets of three to one dollars, which isn't much, because if you park in a handicapped place, guess how much it costs? $500 to get around real quick. So I know many of you hear these things, but if you really go out and drive it, 
and pay attention where you slow down, coming around curves, how many driveways you pass. That's what they're concerned about. They know it's got to happen. We know it's got to happen. We know it's a, 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 a time limit on it. And, and Mr. Valentin probably just cooperated with Georgia DOT because, you know, there's things you cooperate with. But, and nothing happens until somebody says, whoa. So I just want to let you know I'm, I'm not involved in it. I don't live there. But I go to Hiram quite frequently because a friend of mine has a business there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce, for taking this matter under advisement for tomorrow. Next, we have a, pres a presentation uh, from um, Mitch Bulley, Splost Update. Commissioner mm -hmm. Gabby. May I make an announcement? Uh, yes. Many of you know uh, Chaplain Gary McManus over at the jail. He's had a massive uh, heart attack and he's on my support. So y'all please pray for him, <coughs> pray for whoever has to take his place over there, because they've got big shoes to eat. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, our prayers. <coughs> Good morning, Madam Chair, Good morning. members of the board. My name's Terry Gable, and I'm with Moral now, Belly. And Rich has asked me to sit in today. He had some things come up and couldn't make it, so I'll be doing the, the mark report today. Okay. Um, Hopefully I'll get through it. If I go too quick and you need to stop me and ask questions as we go through some of the projects, feel free to do that. So uh, with that, uh, I'll move forward. Uh, so this, this report is uh, reporting on the January collection. You're not in the camera site. Go to the podium part. There you go. There you go. Thank you. So this report is reporting on the January uh, splice collections and also the, the status of the projects through February. Uh, you've seen this same slide before. Uh, this is just uh, reporting on the program cost uh, for, each, for each department. Uh, stand basically about the same, 31 million for, uh, for fire, 17 million for parks and recs, and 30 million dollars for transportation. The transportation is, is down because right now that's not the full budget for it, but we, we still have projects that are, we still have funds that are in buckets. And once we get those assigned, you'll see that you'll see that that move up uh, through uh, through February. Uh, we spent about four and a half million dollars total for the for the program, so it's going very very well. You're going to see that pick up as we go into the close of, of the first last year. Uh, we've got some invoices that'll still come in, so that that cost will go up. Uh, the next three slides are just kind of uh, an overview for each. For each program, for fire, we're at about a half a million dollars. We're expecting that to go up at, towards the end of March. The chief still has some fire trucks that I think uh, that are in, but we're still uh, waiting on the invoices. Uh, transportation, about 2.9 million. The majority of that was the resurfacing for 2017, um, and then with uh, parks and recs at about 150 thousand dollars. So it's it's kind of stayed the same. We'll expect that to go up just a little bit too. Uh, as far as uh, the collections for January is about 1.9 million. We were expecting that to go down some, uh, obviously from December for sure. And the average is about 1.978 million for, for the first 10 months, which is pretty good for the program. Hopefully as we move into 2018, things will, it'll continue to pick up a little bit. But right now, it's, it's really looking pretty, pretty good. Uh, this is just a graphic of the uh, of the same information you can see with December jumped out pretty good and then of course we fell back with January which wouldn't that uh, not be unexpected uh, so there was about a 22 percent change from December to January um, the total for April to January was about 19.5 million um, the 10 month compare that to the 10 month projection was about 19.9 million so you got about a $41,000 shortfall um, which isn't that bad as, as again as we move into 2018 hopefully that'll uh, that'll stabilize and if anything pick up uh, bond service and payment obligations we're about to make the uh, the bigger uh, the big bigger payment for 2017 um, which will bring it up to 9.9 .9 million for the 2017 payment and as we'll move into the spot year 2018 so now we'll uh, I'll go into some of the project updates. The radio system, um, 
I was in a meeting, I think March 8th, with uh, the chief in the city, Motorola, as uh, March 8th was actually the notice to proceed date, but they hit the ground running. It was a very long meeting, about four hours, very detailed and high level. They did a good job. I think, I think we're going to be real impressed with the progress that they're making. Um, they went through in detail about the equipment, how it was all going to be laid out, uh, the towers, locations, the civil sites, and what they were going to be doing for each one. So we should be seeing some progress with Motorola pretty quick. We've got an October 19th uh, completion date on it uh, today. So the Amos, the chief bought one Amos in 2017. Uh, it's in and should be in service. If it's not, it will be very soon. The, both fire trucks, the pumper truck and the ladder truck are in. Um, I think the pumper truck is still in wider and uh, with some minor touches, I think, on the paint. But the ladder truck hopefully is uh, be in display, hopefully this month. Uh, station three renovations, that's the one we, um, we, we bid out and the bids came in high. Um, we have recently met with a, the review, review committee, met with the architect. We're doing some value engineering on the plans. We hope to bring the cost down some. Um, we, we, we looked at the specs and we, we've uh, tried to improve any confusion we think may have been, um, that may have been in the specs for the bidders. And we're gonna put that back out on the street, uh, <coughs> hopefully very soon. And, and uh, if we need to, we'll probably end up having to in, increase the budget. But we, um, <coughs> we'll plan on moving forward with that very soon. Fire station signage is basically complete. Some of it's still in, uh, in fabrication, but uh, Scott tells me it's, about, it's pretty much complete. And with that, we'll move into transportation. The 2017 resurfacing program is basically done. They finished up the punch list uh, first part of the year. Um, so we'll be moving into the 2018 uh, list. I think Miguel and his staff is working with the transportation committee to get that approved. Um, we hope that'll be done soon because we, we do need to get that on the street as soon as we can. Uh, the street lights on Riverside is moving very well. They're, they're over halfway. They're right at the Sweetwater Creek Bridge, I think. Um, we show a March completion date on it. I don't think they're going to make that. Um, but it's, it's a long road. It's about 5.5 miles long. I don't expect, as far as I know, they haven't ran into any other issues. It's just a matter of... of them keep pushing it and and, and getting the getting the cable set and the poles up. The Lee Road extension, as far as I know, is on schedule with a June completion date. And I think Miguel has a staff of meeting next week with them. Hopefully we get a little more detail on how that's going. Rock House Road traffic signal. Um, that project considering it started in, in basically the winter has uh, has went very well. Uh, it's, the roadway's complete, the roadway works complete on it. Uh, they've got the poles up and the mast arms are up. Uh, they're pulling wire now for the, the, the cabinet. And we should see some signals head being hung, hopefully by the end of, or the first week of April. Once that's done, we'll get power on it and start the 30 day burn in April and, and hopefully have that project done somewhere in May. Stuart Mill Road, we have finally gotten um, a draft agreement that Miguel's working on now with the Jacobs um, to move forward with the design on that project. We still got some um, things that we're going to need to get from them. I'm looking at it probably about a May 1st um, and notice to proceed. Hopefully, we can once we get that, Miguel gets the agreement done, we can get that to you for approval, review, and approval. And we got a, a, an August 2019 completion date on it. If we can get the design, to probably if we can get it started in May, the design should finish up towards the end of the year and get it under construction. Um, once right away is purchased and get it under construction the first of the 2019. So Bright Star and John West, John West Road and Chapel Hill were both uh, let contract with uh, uh, Southeast Engineering, and they're they're making good progress. Miguel and I met with them. Um, about two weeks ago, as for a kickoff meeting, they should uh, they should have John West. They started on it first. They should have the plans completed uh, around June for John West, 
and then uh, and then around October for um, Chapel Hill. So both projects are moving well, and SEI is doing a good job on the design of it. And for John West, we're showing our August completion date of next year, which should be about on track, uh, considering with right of way purchases and, and finalizing the design on it. Sweetwater Church Road. We're still working. Miguel's working uh, pretty much one on one with Pauling <laughs> County. You know, they had to go back, and and Miguel, I think, said now that Pauling County is back trying to do some. Re uh, revisions on the plans to try to minimize impact for the two parcels that we were we were having some problems with so it's finally moving forward I think Miguel thinks that's going to start moving forward uh, once we get those plans completed and Miguel and his staff can get the uh, get the signal design uh, hopefully we can get that project on the, on the street and we've shown a January completion date and I'm hoping we can still meet that there's Chapel Hill Road intersection which I said Hopefully the design will be wrapping up around first of the fall, September, October there. Lithia Springs, these next three are the sidewalk projects. Um, we, we're going to put those out for bid this week. They'll be advertised. You know, that's the one we went back that we bid it out, didn't get any, any proposals on it. And we've done, we went out and did some evaluations on the sites. Felt like it was a little bit much. Each site had a had some drainage work that was going to need to be designed and so we felt like we wouldn't really going to be able to approach that job with without plans so we're going to put it back out on the street um, for design services and it'll be advertised this week going through that process we did make some good contacts with some local local vendors and we're going to make sure that those folks are con contacted when we do get it out get it out on the street so i, I feel pretty comfortable that we'll get some proposals on this one comes back <coughs> Uh, equipment wise, Miguel's pretty much got the equipment he's got for 2017. Um, I think he's waiting on a couple pickups and he'll be, he'll be uh, set for, for 2017. We're moving to Gary's Parks and Recs. Um, Boundary Waters Restroom, That's, that project's moving along very well. Carter, Carter and Watkins is uh, designing it. It's about 90% complete. So we're going to be very close to letting that project, the concession stand, out for out for construction very soon and that project's partnered up with the with the soccer field lights once we get once we get the the concession stand bid out we'll have a little bit better idea on our budget this is the one that between the soccer field light the bids we got for it and the concession stand we feel like we're going to be within budget it's going to be close but we did want to get it out to bid to make sure we uh, we wouldn't get caught with any surprises Deer Lake Park Tennis Courts. We uh, took bids, uh, proposals on that last week for design services. Uh, we did get two proposals this time, so those will be in re those will be reviewed, evaluated, and reviewed. We'll have those to you for uh, hopefully approval next month. Multi-purpose multi rec center. The the uh, recommendation for award on this architect is you'll be you'll be approving on it this um, this month. And then the senior center, we've done the evaluations on it, and it'll be um, it'll be following that. Hopefully next month, we'll have a, a recommendation for an architect on the senior center. These next two is Bill Arkin and Fair Play. We've got both of those under design. They, they're moving a little bit slow, but they're just getting started. It should move along very well. We've seen some preliminary plans on it already. Uh, we're doing the we're doing the concession stands at both parks, if you remember, and also doing the uh, and doing all the fencing for both parks but it's moving along very well we do sh we should do show a completion date of june 19th on that uh the same uh with gear i think he's got most of his equipment in maybe expecting one pickup again we're wrapping everything up for this last year um which should be should be about there with everything he was expecting our program management expenses uh We've wrapped up, I think, our 2017, and we've we've got an agreement with uh, Bill's office for 2018. So I think all that's in the works now. We'll be moving forward and looking forward to continuing the program through 2018. So the last, that's the last of the the dash report on the project specific project updates. Um, 
these next couple of slides, you know, we, we're tracking this now for partners, local partners within within Douglas County, trying to keep percentages and be reporting that to you either monthly or semi-monthly as this changes so that we at least know where we stand and you you guys would know kind of uh, areas we need to improve in and we're working with, of course, with the county staff on doing that. But we're still right around 45 vendors. Um, 14 of those are in Douglas County and about 15 are outside within 30 miles of Douglas County. So, so that's good. Um, if you totaled up the percentage-wise of the number of vendors, it's about 64% that are within 30 miles of Douglas County. So that's a pretty good number. Um, but the but the uh, invoices paid out is still is right now is still low for the for the vendors that are within Douglas County. Uh, the big thing about that one, excuse it, is C. W. Matthews, which is within 30 miles. But that you know they had the the resurfacing contract, which kicked that which kicked that percentage up. But we'll keep monitoring it, keep tracking it, and reporting it. And uh, again, working with staff to, to try to get this out and um, advertise it and, and make sure the locals are aware of the projects. And with that, I'll take any questions. If okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners or the comments? Commissioner Robinson, question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple quick questions, and maybe just for a point. Um, the as it relates to your the spend of the project, you, you mentioned something about forty-one thousand dollars short. Just remind me what that number was again. That was a shortfall. The average of the the first ten months. Yep. Um, as the average. Yeah. All right. Um, and, and so one of the things we, we're trying to emphasize as we go into this, you know, this full year, is to keep track of you know, <coughs> the shortfall. And I'm going to look for my director to sort of weigh in on that. Um, two, two things. One, we do anticipate. Maybe there's an assumption that the economy is, is, is healing and whole for the most part. We, we got a report from our um, University of West Georgia, um, Dr. Joy Smith, that says that at least West Georgia is out of recession for the past two years. Great. That means that income is stable, right? And perhaps it will grow a little bit. With it growing, that means people are going to be spending a little bit more, either offline or online. And I guess my question is, what do we anticipate? Um, because again, and I'm going to look to, um, um, one more year, we experience one more year of the loss dropping before it stabilizes, or are we already into that, direct the hallway? I don't know if I follow your question, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah, absolutely. Do we anticipate our loss negotiations for mm -hmm. loss, both option sales tax? Um, do we have one more year of it shrinking because of our SDS, I mean, because of our relationship with the... This is the... Uh, final year from last year to this year um, and then from 2018 through 2022 or 21 I think it's 2022 um, it will remain <coughs> five yes, straight years of stableness right. yes right. so so I guess my question is how are we do we anticipate or do we have a reserve that will make up for that shortfall or are we just sort of going along with it and, and, and again um, I'm just asking this question. I just I got to keep driving home this point because we're only forecasting. We're only sort of speculating what we think will happen. Right. And so the point is, and this is new for you to hear this, but to hear it from her directly, we're, we're we're sensitive that we programmed a certain amount and we optimize to spend, but because we don't have control of the macro environment, it's sort of like you need to you know like a reserve or anything else. And so I, I guess, I, I mean, how are we tracking that? That that is, is more of an open question. How are we tracking that? <coughs> well, I mean, I know Rich and Jennifer working very close to make sure we got a reserve uh, built into the the balance of. In, in we're Thanks. checking it very close as far as the projects that are that we know and when they're going to be built, and and at least in 2018 and and, and further out. So and just make make sure we maintain a reserve based on. Uh, pay go money and funds that are coming in. Are we actually maintaining it or we just we've got it on our report. Our software is showing us, you know, actual versus, you know, budgeted. But <coughs> is, is that money somewhere? I mean, is somebody actually saying, okay, we're not gonna spend this. It's one thing to say it. It's another to say do we are we are we have we allocated I won't say allocated, that's the wrong word, but I think you get the spirit of what I'm saying is that 
I just mm. don't want to oh, yeah. miss this. Not just on paper. And, I, and I, Jennifer might can weigh in on that, but yeah, that's the full, in, the full intentions is to have the funds that there in the bank uh, that we know we're not going to spend. Um, just to have a backup, uh, you know, depending on what the, uh, the SPLOS revenues do over the next course of the next year. Yes. Um, you know, right now we're spending, uh, drawn down on bond proceeds only. Um, and then the PAYGO money that we get after the bond debt service for the bond year is fully funded, then we get what we call PAYGO money. Yes. Uh, that's going in a separate bank account and we're not drawing down on those funds. We're letting those funds set aside and only pull down on the bond proceeds. But even after, you know, we, we've Work with Rich, and he's kind of scheduled out all the projects. You know, it's going to, you know, year three and four is going to be pretty tight because we have a very large debt service payment. Um, and those years, compared to what the SPLOS comes in, it's going to take 10 to 11 months to fund the debt service. Um, so those, those years, we're looking at it preliminary right now, but it looks like that there's going to be some projects that may we may have to slow down a little bit. Um, or that we, you know, postpone until year five and six that uh, we have the funds um, available to proceed with them. That's 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 my point. Mm -hmm. um, which is, um, <clears throat> we have nothing to prove to the public other than do right. We don't need to put ourselves in a precarious position where we're, we're trying to burn, 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 spin, spin, spin. And I appreciate you stating what you're saying. So I guess my question is, we have what's on the list and what's at the bottom of the list. And I guess the last time we were here, and this is more of a question, which was, do you have the capacity within your software to show us that these are green projects, they're absolutely good to go. Then there's those yellow projects that are sort of at the top of the bottom of the list, and mm -hmm. at the top of the bottom of the list, you know, sort of in between, and we know things that are red that we're totally, we, we're just not going to get to. Is there a way that we can begin to, I mean, we're having this conversation two years before, years four, um, three and four, we said we know it's going to, four and five, we said it's going to be tight. How do we... How are you going to track that? And, and you know, versus how do you show that you actually know what project's going to get sacrificed? Because then we as elected officials can set expectations of the public and within ourselves it says, this not might not make it, guys. I know we said we wanted to go do this, but the reality is that you can't blow the butt. We, we, you just can't spend to just be spending just to prove something. And I, I think the spirit of the SPLOS was to do improvements, do operations in such a way to sort of, you know, move things along, but it, it, there's a, I'm, I, I'm probably more conservative in this area, and I'll, I'll leave that as my last question. Can you somebody answer? How do we? Well, I think last the last couple of meetings we've had, um, and we had one big budget meeting about the SPLOS, <coughs> which I know Jennifer's been involved in that too. But based on the current projections, we're not going to reach at this moment. We're not going to reach any projects below the line below the line where we thought, okay, here's, here's the line. Yes. Um, these are possible projects that we can get to if, if revenues come in yes. more than expected. Um, so right now, we're not going to be able to reach anything below the line okay. currently. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, based on revenues and based on some of these projects coming in under budget, hopefully, that that couldn't change. Exactly. And it depends on these categories, <coughs> these categories figured separately. And it also means that even the ones above the line, maybe if they were originally programmed to start in year three, we may have to bump that to year four or mm -hmm. year five because of the cash flow. Right. And so they'll still be done in order. Mm -hmm. They just may be pushed back a year or so, right. depending, on, depending on cash flow. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that, that's all we're trying to do is have the conversation so it's not a shock at the end and, and just for our peers so that we know that certain things that are on there that we might have had certain constituents or a base of people that were expecting something, but we've got to be honest and real uh, about where things stand. So that's all I want to bring out. I'm sure I'm going to yield. Okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you, um, Mr. Mulk here. Yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, it's all about, you know, staying within your means and, and working to your projections and, and within your priorities. Having said that, uh, Douglas County has been fortunate in having some very significant investments in our in our county, i.e. several very large data centers, which will generate uh, ta tax revenues. Uh, is it implausible to think that uh, the income tax revenue, non-residential tax revenue coming from these data centers will, will enable us to complete 
uh, everything that's above the line, in other words, already prioritized, and uh, possibly some things below the line. I'm asking you to look at the crystal ball, uh, Jennifer. I, I appreciate that. But let's don't, not ignore the fact that we've had some significant investments in our county. So is that going to give us some leeway? It could. That we're not Absolutely. counting on right this minute. Absolutely. It, it's definitely an additional funding source that um, is going to be coming down the pipeline as early as 2020. I think that we would see the major hit to the digest. Okay. And we're not projecting any, anything of that sort right now. It's premature. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yes. I yield back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just a couple the sidewalk projects. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that once more to make sure I, I kind of heard what you said about what we are? Because I think you went back out to bid from understanding what you stated. Uh, it, it's going to cost us a little bit more based on some drainage issues and some other things that you guys are kind of encountering. Yeah. So, so when we when we first put it out, right. you know, we didn't uh, we didn't get any bidders on it, and then we went out and done. Uh, in-house we've done some field evaluations just look at it to make sure that we couldn't take sections of it and possibly go straight it just bid out for construction Understood. and we talked to some local vendors and but once we got to look at them in more detail all of them had some sort of design work that was going to be needed mm -hmm. um, so we finally made a decision and in, in talking to some of the local vendors too that it would be best just to put it out for design services which we which will be advertised this week I think it runs Wednesday Thursday and Friday okay. mm -hmm. um, and then of course it'll it'll the proposal will be due in 30 days so that that's the goal right now is to put, put it back out on the street and I think I've had enough conversations and Miguel has too with some of the local vendors and I feel pretty sure we're going to get uh, get the proposals we were looking for the first time uh, and this will just be for design services right, it right. won't be for construction so you think with that, you, you will be within the price point what we are trying to deal with? Because I think that's yeah. the number that we're trying to, you know, because everybody, we're thinking that it, was, it, it will cost more doing it this way, I guess. I don't know. You, you, got, you guys tell me. Yeah. Well, I, I, what we're doing now would, would have had to been done regardless. Um, I think we were thinking if, if we could have picked out some sections maybe that didn't have to have the curb didn't have to have the curb and gutter and the drainage um, that you probably could have got a, a little lower cost on those uh, and, and possibly have picked up some smaller contractors construction contractors but when we started looking at it holistically we just realized we weren't going to be able to do that it was they're going to have to be bid out if not all three of them together individual projects and not break out any sections but do them do the whole things. I don't necessarily think what the cost is going to come in is just what it's going to be, because uh, everything that they'll, the designers are going to end up, the items we're going to end up in that contract are going, to ha we're going to have to have them. Um, I think we got, a, I think I got a pretty good idea on budget for them, uh, and I think it'll fall, it'll fall within, I think that'll fall within the budget that we currently have in the, uh, for those three schools and the projects in what so we got. Still falling fall. in, in, in budget. Yeah. You know, and back in one thing about the where the sidewalks are, you know, they're they're under that that uh, they're under the bucket uh, that we don't have a lot of cost on either. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the areas we're still trying to refine and get cost. The bridges was up, was up under there also that that DOT is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got we got you know that that's obviously going to come into play at some point. Right. right. But I don't I don't see with the design services that we're going to get mm -hmm. uh, with what they're going to come up with. I don't really see any any big unknowns that you know that we didn't know that we were going into okay. with these sidewalk projects. Okay, okay. And and uh, the senior citizen center. Mm -hmm. We spoke a little bit about that kind of from what we don't have anything yet or where we are at this point in time, will it fit or we haven't did the P and E yet or I mean No, so okay. we're uh, where we're at with the, the senior centers that we have taken bids on it for design services. The proposals have been evaluated. Um, we're very close to making a recommendation. It just won't be this month. Uh, <clears throat> Bill, is that correct? That's true. It could, it, we hope to have a, a recommendation made at the next commission meeting. Got it. Ready for the next commission meeting. And, and where you can, can share with us, I mean, with as little you can share, is it <coughs> looks promising or is it yes. yes. we should be overly concerned? No, we're, we're fine. Oh, yes. We're fine. Oh, we're, yeah. well, no, with, the, with the cost of the uh, <coughs> A and E, the mm -hmm. architecture, the engineering. Right. Mm -hmm. And we don't have anything yet on the construction. Right. This is yeah. just to design and engineer. <coughs> but if that part of it is in line, it is. And everything else probably will be somewhat placed to be made to go in line. I guess. Oh yeah. 
So, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you again, and, and, and I must say, continue the job well done. Uh, I mean, and thanks for these updates. I think these are, are really great. And, and how's our program uh, community manager? You know, I guess we'll hear from him later on, I guess, Madam Chair or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, okay. I'll yield back. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Um, uh, under fire and EMS, uh, the uh, radio system has come in way under budget. Mm -hmm. So there's extra money there to apply to the station three, uh, fire station, I would hope. <laughs> Well, I'll let Bill answer that, but I think those funds, because of the nature of the, of the, the, the factors that brought that, that did, there were some savings in it, I think that money's going to be held, because we're not really sure as we move through this radio system, Bill, is that correct, uh, that we may not, all of them may not come to fruition, so we, I don't think that money, we're going to be able to allow that money but to. some of it probably could be used because of, what, half a million or better? savings on the uh, and, I, uh, and there's you, some other money in renovations too we just I mean they just had a set amount of two million dollars for renovation so as soon as we get the final price on station three then we'll make a recommendation or we'll come to the fire and EMS mm -hmm. committee and then back to the board okay. and the recommendation of whether it's funds to come. and I understand there's a lot more renovation needed there because it is the oldest one I think yeah. in the county yeah. so uh, <coughs> So, you know, based on our original estimate, and, and it's it's going to be higher than that in the estimate that we that we first looked at. I think we know that now. We just want to make sure that the bids we're getting, that everybody's comfortable with them, and we're, we're getting what we're paying for, and that that some of the reasons wasn't because it's the contractors weren't exactly sure about what Douglas County wanted to be done. That's what we're going to have. We're going to have a pre-bid meeting this time, a, a mandatory pre-bid meeting. To make sure that they know exactly what we're, we're asking for and make sure there's no confusion in the plans and then we're going to go back out for bid and, and hopefully we'll be able to award the, the low bid on this next go around well, I, I used to work for a general contractor so, and i know that bids sometimes are there's errors in them and everything but this is quite a bit uh, of an error so uh, yeah. anyway um i go back mm -hmm. okay uh, Terry, uh, last but not least, I just had one comment regarding <coughs> savings as well. I'm quite sure Commissioner Guy would uh, echo me with this. Is there a savings with the uh, Post Road Bridge as well? You know, would that be a savings as well? Yeah, and it's in, obviously, it's in, uh, that's in transportation. But yeah, that's, uh, I'm in communications with GDOT. You know, as far as uh, Douglas County's responsibilities, mm -hmm. it's just to, to uh, uh, do some basic things no financial obligations to it so that all the money that was budgeted for that bridge it'll it'll be within the whatever we decide to do with it as far as um, transportation okay thank you any other questions from the board of commissioners thank you so much mr gay thank you next you have the approval of the minutes uh, i encourage you board of commissioners to just review your minutes tomorrow so you can be prepared to approve tomorrow Next, we have a public hearing tomorrow, which is tab number four. The public hearing is for the purpose of considering amending section 14-72C of the County Code of Ordinances relating to the zones prohibiting trucks with more than six wheels to remove a road um, or roads from the list to establish a truck and passenger vehicle detour uh, route due to the uh, closure of Mosley Street Railroad uh, Crossing. Director Valentin, please bring us up to speed. Good this morning, item is uh, tabled from uh, February 20th. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good Commissioner, uh, this item uh, at the last meeting, there was a request for additional outreach to the public. We had a public meeting over at the Transportation Center last week to allow those residents along the <coughs> second option detour route to have uh, to be able to look at the plan look at the maps look at the routes and have some public <coughs> input however um, we did not get uh, very many residents who came out to that particular meeting so either uh, they're more comfortable with the detour being on along the loan or some other reason but uh, in any event we afforded the opportunity to those residents to have input as well uh, they may be at the hearing tomorrow uh, that might be another 
possibility. Uh, but essentially, uh, we came about uh, setting those uh, detour routes was there were preliminarily there were meetings between the city, the county, and the Georgia BOP to discuss the situation. And uh, the original route discussed was the Malone uh, route, uh, industrial access and municipal, municipal access, industrial access road. And uh, as a result of that meeting, uh, there was a suggestion to use the, the Maroney Mill and uh, North Burn Hickory, particularly because there were traffic signals at both ends of those roads. So that was uh, one of the main reasons for that second option to come about. Both of them were discussed uh, thoroughly with the city and, and uh, the Georgia DOT and the county. And so those are the two options on the table. There's been other routes discussed uh, thrown out, suggested. In fact, the Georgia DOT had to, because of the timing of the closure of uh, the railroad crossing, had to designate an official detour route, which they did, and they put all the traffic on state routes, because those are the routes that they have jurisdiction. So in order for there to be a local route, the local agency has to approve. And in the case of Malone and industrial access, the city has uh, uh, exposure or borders most of those uh, roads. Now, the city has indicated that they are in support of that road if that is selected by, by the county as well. So uh, that's what's going to be before you tomorrow. I would anticipate uh, that there will be public input as you <coughs> probably had uh, last time. There may, might be some additional uh, folks from along Malone, perhaps. Um, but the, essentially, the reason for the public hearing is that we would have to, the county would have to amend uh, the ordinance to remove either Huey Road, in the case of Malone, or Maroney Mill, in the case of the Maroney Mill North uh, Burn Hickory routes because they are currently restricted by ordinance so that there would be no trucks over six wheels on those routes. Now, along uh, Huey, particularly there's a section, I guess, between industrial access and Malone. It is just that section that would need to be removed from the list, not the entire length of, of Huey Road. So that's what you will have before you tomorrow. Okay. I'd be happy to answer it. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Guido? Yes. Um, Miguel, uh, in Huey Road already being used by uh, the uh, oil company right there for trucks? Yes. Um, so yeah, why, is it, what is it, why is it <coughs> saying no trucks for that without the city approving? Because they're already doing it. Well, because there is the, the restriction against trucks uh, following a particular route is only if they do not have a delivery along that route or if, do, if they don't have a facility in that neighborhood. So anybody that operates already by right within a certain neighborhood has to be able to traverse certain roads. And so they cannot be prohibited from doing that regardless of whether the city or the county has a restriction on But the access road, industrial access does. I mean, it already is approved for trucks, right? Because That is correct. Right. And what about the other Malone, end, Malone, Malone Street, right. where it's divided? Mm -hmm. I went out there and rode it. <laughs> so uh, is it approved for trucks? Uh, it, is, it, is not, it is not currently restricted. Now, the, the uh, the main logistical issue with that route is that there are no traffic signals on the end. Well, uh, before you had the crossing where it mostly, <coughs> and then you brought the trucks back to Highway 92 and there wasn't a traffic light there either. Understood, understood. So but that's, you, that's the you main... You really hadn't changed anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, what I couldn't understand is why was mostly closed to begin with because it's about two or three blocks from the underpass to begin with. Uh, 
why did why did they do that? I know the state has a mind of their own. I'm finding that well, out actually, of Highway yeah, 78 and Main Road. Let me okay. I will not speak to that element, uh, uh, but uh, however, it, it was really the railroad that triggered the requirement because the railroad has to do some work in order to facilitate uh, the road project, mm -hmm. and they were not. Uh, either able or not comfortable proceeding with that work without the closure of most of them. And another, th uh, one last point is, I don't care where we put the detour, the truck drivers are gonna use their GPS and pick out their own favorite way of going through that. Is that not right? Because <laughs> if, they, if they can get to their destination, they're gonna use the best route for them. Well, and, and Commissioner, to your point, generally the detour route wants to be as short as possible and as close to the closure as possible. I understand that. <coughs> uh, but uh, like Lee Road, uh, when you come down Lee Road into Lithia Springs and go across the railroad track, is that a state road? Uh, Brownsville, um, Lithia, whatever. It goes to Brownsville Road up there. I don't know that that is a state route, but that would be a, a longer route, longer option. Well, I know it, but it's a more di direct, too. Uh, if, if it goes straight to Brownfield Road and then back into 92, up at, in Paulden County. Also by the, by the uh, grocery store. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I mean. Well, I, I just see <laughs> GPS using routes like that. that um, but the only thing that concerned me about the Moroni Mill Road was the speed. Because it is a, a, a lot of a, a straightaway type thing, but there's a real bad curve and a hill in that curve that I, I would worry much about because of the speed of the trucks more than anything else. Not the number of the trucks, but the speed. Now you're back. Okay. Any other questions from Commissioner Mitchell? But, I mean, we, we had this kind of conversation, so I guess I just want to share, because we, you're right, we, when you're looking at the one that's going, uh, that crosses Huey, and just close it in, we just had a conversation with GDOT and a few others uh, about that little sliver of road, mm -hmm. and, and, and you're right. Yes, yeah. yes right. <laughs> and, and I even stated just what you're basically saying, and you might want to share with them as well, about my concern was the safety, but from GDOT and driving that road, it works. So, would you share with them our conversation? Uh, yeah. Miguel? Essentially, uh, yeah. as part of the early discussions, GDOT, uh, once once the options were were set, uh, GDOT took some equipment, heavy equipment, uh, tractor trailer, out there and, and rode both of those routes. And they indicated that uh, their preferred route was the Moroni Mill uh, Northburn Hickory because it was signalize right. at both ends right. and more direct right. however that they could also use the other route if necessary so uh, both options are available okay. let's, let's, let's oh. just be real cautious because we got a public hearing more okay. about being committal oh okay. this yeah. meeting is just to announce you yes. have a public hearing right, 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 right. before we work it out before the public Right. And, 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 and okay. we're not working it out though. We're, we're just having conversation because I know we had conversation about uh, the, the various, and, and that's why I proposed to look at both uh, detours versus that that one. And you'll probably have a few people uh, come out asking for and or against it. I just expect it, but a decision <laughs> will have to be made, as I stated last time around, as to which route we would take. But the good part is either one worked. Now, Miguel, did we ever? And I know I asked this question before. Did we ever get uh, GDOT to buy into both, if it ended up being both? I think they just prefer to be responsible in the end, two years mm -hmm. later, if it takes that long, to be responsible for kind of putting back, uh, the, you know, making us good, a whole, with just one. Am I so, correct? Okay. Commissioner, to, to your point, uh, GDOT has, um, as a result of pretty substantial, extensive discussions, agreed to remedy any damage to the road. Mm -hmm. However, they certainly would like to keep that, that as, as uh, short a section as possible right. uh, <coughs> because, because it is on their exposure. So 
They've indicated they, they're going to go, they've gone out there and taken some poor samples of the pavement, mm -hmm. and uh, they will be responsible for any repairs during the use of that route mm -hmm. by trucks, and then um, upon completion, they'll overlay the whole, whole route. So they indicated they would, they would not, uh, they, they would not be uh, uh, agreeable to both routes being used, but they would, either one that was selected, they would uh, be responsible for repair. And whichever route becomes uh, uh, the detour route, um, they will be responsible. Um, and it'll be notified, whether it's via GPS and any other means of truckers, which we can't control kind of what yeah. these guys do or don't do. <laughs> I mean, they gonna do what they want to right, do. Right, that, that'll be on them, but at least we're gonna do everything in our books to include GDOT and, and, and everybody else to kind of notify these guys, meaning truckers, as to this is the, the detour route to take, and um, this is what you're exposed to, and I guess from a law enforcement perspective, I guess then we will be have to deal with our uh, law enforcement to assure that they do things by the books. So, but I, I mean, I, I, I think the good part is either one will work, and uh, I guess by tomorrow we'll make a decision as to which one that it will be, but um, we had lots of conversations about this, so and Miguel, thank you for all your hard work in trying to help figure this out, and hopefully the community will show up and ask questions, and, and we'll decide on what that is tomorrow, so I yield back. Okay, any other questions from the board? Thank you so much, Director Valentini. Next tab, number five on our resolutions, we have a resolution to rename the Douglas County Fire and EMS Department Training Complex in memory of L. Wayne Arrington, the founding chief of the Douglas County Fire Department. Chief Spencer? Uh, Chief Spencer, he's actually in court. Here. Sorry about that, Deputy court. Chief. Thank yep, you. what we're Arrington. asking is to rename our training complex on uh, Wortham Road <coughs> in name of our founding chief, and uh, would I ask the Board of Commissioners to <coughs> approve that. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Mulk here. Give us a thumbnail sketch of what's involved with renaming and what, what signs we're going to be changing. And we're we're going to do, re working with some local companies to try to get a sign donated, and we have a sign out front that says the Douglas County Fire Department Training Complex. We'd like to swap that sign out and then possibly put one up on the tower but we've broken with a couple of companies now. The sign out front's the one on the fence. The one and then on there's the one, there's one on the roadway yeah. on Cedar Mountain. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. But Thank we'd you. like to put something special up on the side of the <coughs> complex that you can see from a Bortham Road. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the board commissioners? Thank you. Thank y'all. Tab number six, resolution to amend the 2018 budget for 2017 rollover encumbrances, grants, and projects. Uh, Director Hallman. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning. This is uh, my annual housekeeping adjustment that I come before the board every year after we close uh, the prior fiscal year. Uh, we closed out to uh, 2017 and any open purchase orders that were valid, um, that were Maybe the purchase order was done in 2017, but the item or the service was not provided until the 2018. Uh, then we roll over that purchase order um, so that it does not affect the department's current 2018 budget because they may have had the funds in their 2017 budget. Um, also, we had some grants that um, because the state fiscal year and the federal fiscal year is different than our fiscal year, uh, we had some grants that were approved later in the year, and so that's. Um, revenue coming in and expenditures going out so we just roll that over as well into the 2018 budget so this is primarily just a, or not primarily it is a housekeeping adjustment to adjust the 2018 budget um, for all the departments affected okay any questions from the board commissioners commissioner Geiger could we get the estimates uh, sure uh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. She yeah it is in the back. Yes. Sorry, it's by it. line <laughs> item. It's not by purchase order. Just because of the way our system does it, it's by line item. But you can see, but the the largest one that you um, that makes up a lot this total is the Bleakley Building. Um, the money that we had left over to uh, redo the Bleakley Building gets rolled over into the next year. That was the majority of it. But you had some smaller purchase orders 
you know, that range from a thousand dollars, you know, all the way up to, you know, ten thousand or whatever, but the list is attached. Okay. So I like that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, County Administrator, do you have any business today? Um, yes, ma'am. There's one item that, um, if the board sees fit, that we need to add. So, Miss Anita Granger was uh, notified last Friday of an $11,000 grant from the CJCC uh, for DUI and drug court. Um, we couldn't put it on the next agenda because it has to be signed and returned to the CJC no later than March 30th, 2018. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to add this to the agenda. to the agenda. Uh, Jennifer has all that information. It will go under the regular agenda. It will be new business. Um, but uh, Ms. Granger is here if you all have any questions on the grant. Okay, Ms. Granger, could you please come forward? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Would you like to tell us a little bit about this grant? <coughs> so apparently the CJCC has some emergency funds. And as I was looking at the expenditures in my drug screening line item, which is under other professional services in my budget, um, I noticed that I was going to have spent all of the um, CJCC grant monies and their fiscal year runs from July 1 to June 30th. Um, I would have, by the third quarter, the end of the third quarter this March, I would have spent essentially all of that grant money for the drug screen. So I went ahead. They gave us like a week window to apply for emergency funds, and I thought couldn't hurt. I could use the money rather than having to come to y'all at the end of next, at the end of this our fiscal year to get more monies. That I would just go ahead and reach out to them, and they did give me an additional eleven thousand to get me through um, with our drug screening, and, and that's really the the basis of accountability courts. Without drug screening, we can't do all the other stuff that we do. So. I would ask that you accept this money. <laughs> okay, any questions from the board? I have no objections to putting it on the agenda. Yeah, we'll put it on the agenda. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you so much. Tab number seven, authorization, authorization to approve a grant with judicial alternatives of Georgia Incorporation, JAG, for felony probation services for Superior Court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final re review. Judge I'm, I'm on. I'm going to handle those, I think, Madam Chair. Items 7 and 8 are the essentially what's happened, two things. Number one, there was a change uh, with Neil Deppmarine's retirement, so a contract typically initiated by Chief State Court Judge that can roll over automatically. Both uh, the Superior Court in Item 7 and the State Court in Item 8 have gotten together. We've made revisions to the contract because the law has changed, as you all are aware. And essentially what this contract does is the probationer pays all the fees. There's no real drain on the county coffers and it's got the requirements laid out. What I will tell you is that what's changed is the indigent portion of it. If there's an indigent being supervised under probation as determined by the court, there's no expense on the court or the county. It's just e eaten by the company. So they get their fees out of what is non-indigent work essentially. This contract doesn't have a date on it. We're gonna put a date though, expiring December 31st, 2018, because we want it to line up with our other contracts on both sev items seven and eight. Uh, and I would tell you that there's a way out. I think it's a 30 day notice for each, either party can give 30 days notice. If there's a change in the chief judge, I think the probation department, probation company gets 90 days to transition time as opposed to immediately ending. And so these contracts have been vetted by legal uh, both judges have vetted them, and we've also reached out to our counterparts in other counties because of the changes in law to ensure that we were complying with the law. So these are updates. And they, by the way, we didn't have anything to do with the selection. These are selected by the chief judge in both the Superior Court and State Court. But we'd ask y'all to consider approving those tomorrow. And I think the judges are in court today. That's why they couldn't be here. Okay. Any questions from the board? Thank you. Okay. Vice Chair Watson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, we can. We can I'm just going to tack this, pin this for you, perhaps tomorrow when the judges are here. But I guess my first question is, um, it, the dollar amount? Right? It, yeah, there, there's, it's, it's based on what service is being provided. In other words, there's no, I don't think there's a base amount in here. If it's, uh, it's one amount, if there is just fine only owed by somebody, it's one amount. If it's monitored with an ankle bracelet, 
it's another amount if it's monitored with fines and or community service and other aspects attached to it. And there's another amount if there's incarceration that then leads to probation. So it's broken down segmentally, and I can tell you the section. Um, I'm sorry, I should have had this before. It's 15 pages, so it's a little long. Um, you knew I was going to ask a number. But okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. let me tell you what paragraph it is and save y'all some time. Uh, if you look at G on the item 7, page 8 of 15, it starts at the bottom of page 8 and goes into page 9. Uh, for regular probation supervision, which includes a minimum of one office, contact per month, there may be required up to four. The probation shall pay a fee of $39 per month. For intensive probation supervision, which includes a minimum of one office contact per week and four office contacts each month, probationers shall pay a fee of $50 per month. Jack shall collect such probation fee for each month of probation under probation, and then there's an accounting and remission, remittance back to the court. A one more super, supervision fee is defined as the date the probation is placed on probation. There's some other breakdown fees. There's some people that only have to pay a fine, and they pay it over time, and that number is $39 uh, per month. There's some services with uh, the GPS tracking device, and they've got a rate breakdown on a page eight of that. And I think those fees are consistent in both contracts, seven and eight, because they basically mirror each other. Once for felony probation, the other one's for Mr. Mann. Okay. And I'll, I'll close with this last question. Um, this was a, two, three years ago. Um, there was conversations, and there was an action taken by the Board of Commissioners um, whereby uh, we were subsidizing, uh, basically, the probation. And I want to know, is that a provision in this contract? I know we're looking at a lot of conversations. Do we bring it in-house? Do we keep it outsourced, et cetera? I know we've had a transition, so this is a, a, a fair question. It says, are we still required to have to, do we anticipate, or do we anticipate subsidizing any shortfalls in this one? Do we reset this one? Okay. No, sir, we do not. Okay. There's no subsidizing on this. This is a new, uh, I say new, they were our probation team last year. Mm -hmm. um, I think there were some issues with the previous mm -hmm. um, company, which we did have to subsidize those. Um, but no, with this company, we are not. Okay. All right, so, so if I looked in the budget for last year, since they were there last year, that means they were whole. We, we didn't have to put up anything. They ate their Well, last year, was it was a little bit of both. So the contract with the new one didn't come in with, with JAG, I think is the name of it. It didn't come in until maybe March or so, okay. something like that. I'd have to look back to be sure I'm just going by memory. Yeah. But Sentinel was in, they were in, uh, they were our probation team before that. Okay, and then the last question is, who's responsible for evaluation program? <coughs> like, for example, the jail is self-contained, right? We, we understand how to perhaps evaluate that. Um, you, you, know, you hear from citizens who say that, you know, these guys, treat us wrong, even though they're on probation, they still have a certain degree of, of, of expectation. Uh, and I guess my question is, who evaluates them uh, that actually, are they just collecting checks, just collecting fines, are they, what value are they bringing back to sort of, I mean, we had this conversation with them, do we get into programming, I mean, all these things, I mean, are you just sort of people check in and they get their fines and fees, or who evaluates it? Is it the judge? Is it somebody at the state? I'm just asking that. We can bring it up tomorrow. I don't have to believe at this point. I think ultimately it's the judge because the judge is the one entering the... The judge oversees all probation through the department, through the department whoever it is, yeah. is contracting for the service. Mm -hmm. I think your question is a little deeper for probationers having a problem. How do they report that? Well, they can probably report it to the state or they can report it to the sheriff's department. If it's a crime, they can report it to the judge. Theoretically, yeah. I've been on both sides of this. I've actually sued a probation department, not one that was in Douglas County. Uh, but there's a, there's a, there's means to get remedies. Okay. And okay. there's a complaint process. There is a process and yeah. so forth. And so and again, I'm not trying to get into the judge's authority. It was just more of a, you know, just want to make sure because we do get questions all the time right. with people's experiences with um, dealing with government because they see government as one whole thing. All right, I yield back. I'm sure. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much. We'll move on to tab number nine.
Staff number nine is the authorization to submit the 2019 grant application for family treatment court. Is Jenny McDade here? Is Jenny McDade? Yeah, she has to Okay. Well, we'll move on and mark it Tab number 10, authorization to submit an application for the fiscal year juvenile justice and Senate grant in the amount of $160,000 and authorized <coughs> chairman to sign all related documents and no match required. And that's um, Jenny McDade as well, so she's not getting a real follow up with her. And tab number 11, authorization to award a contract to Sutton Architects Incorporation for the design of a multi purpose recreation center at the cost of $339,950 as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, Director Dukes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, the, uh, all the submittals were evaluated by the SPLOSH evaluation team, and that team recommended Sutton Architects to design our new multipurpose recreation center. Uh, we then took it before the Recreation Committee, and uh, they advised uh, as well selected uh, Sutton Architects. So uh, at, they approved the selection of the uh, SPLOSH team. So uh, we're bringing it to you today to uh, the commission meeting. Okay, any questions? Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so, um, so we're gonna, inside their scope of work, did they, did they talk about how they will gain public input um, or to, is that part of the process in which um, are we just going to build this or uh, I'm just curious as the process because I mean as we know we want to build this multi-purpose uh, uh, rec center um, and it's something that we talked about but as it relates to what goes in it functionality I know there's some base functionality but still how do we anticipate engaging um, the public on a vertical building and Gary, we've had this conversation, so I just wanted to bring out what we were thinking. Right. Uh, they, show, they show a lot of uh, working with the department, working with the recreation department, with the director and, and the employees of the recreation department. Okay. They also will have public input as far as uh, what the public would like to see uh, in the design. How do you anticipate, I mean, I, I guess there's, and again, how will you anticipate capturing that information? Um, uh, we, we could do it in a number of ways. Uh, you know, public meetings, uh, surveys, uh, putting surveys out, putting information, uh, responding information on the, our, our website, yeah. in the county website. Yep. Uh, those are several ways we could do it. And I, I, again, it, it, they're there for design. I'm just curious how was that part of the scope of work, which was to engage the community, or whether that's going to fall on the shoulders of the Parks and Rec group to supplement their uh, formal professional service efforts. I mean, I, I don't have a preference one way or another. I'm just trying to understand the right. process. It was not in the scope of work. Okay. All right. So that falls on us to a certain extent. Okay. Um, you said the cost was um, roughly 300, a little less than 400,000, 380. Okay. Correct. Um, and that's within our budget. 339. 339, and that was in our budget? Yes. Um, it's part, a big part of the total amount that was allocated for this project. Right, right, that, right, I got you. And I guess my the final question is, is how long do they anticipate this process would take? Would that a schedule built into this or? Nine months. The design, you're talking about the, the, just, just the design, design. not the construction. Right. Yeah. Design. Three months, three to six months. Three six months. Nine months yeah. start to finish three six months. Okay. And will renderings and things of that nature be shared as a milestone or checkpoint within this to the board of commissioners? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to again make sure people get to see it. All right. How are you about to? Okay. We have questions from the board. And and we'll <coughs> as, as as thank you, Madam Chair. As uh, Gary has alluded to, we'll, we'll update everybody again on not only this item, but all the other items later on, but, but yes. Um, Through the Oversight Committee? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, yes, Director Dukes. Yes, ma'am. Tab number 12, 
authorization to approve a change order to the TUSA Consulting Services contract uh, in the amount of $50,000 due to an increase in the scope of work to be performed and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Peacock. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on May 1st of 2017, we signed the, the consulting contract with TUSA to provide us all the consulting services that were necessary to um, uh, to plan and implement the new radio system for Douglas County. The original cost cost proposal that TUSA submitted to us uh, included um, a cost for a five-site RF tower configuration. Um, after we uh, actually had uh, Motorola design the plan, uh, that increased to um, a total of nine sites. So um, a, a, an increase from five to nine. Uh, so TUSA is asking that we uh, provide some additional funding for them to uh, do all of the uh, testing and um, uh, making sure that the tower sites are appropriate. Mm -hmm. There's also a, 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 an amount of money involved for the inter-subsystem interface. The original contract only called for one or two Inner system, uh, inner subsystem interfaces, but because of the way that we've designed the um, the system and the desire to have it interoperable with multiple other vendors, uh, it, that's increased to five. We're going to be uh, uh, connected with Cobb County, Fulton County, uh, the Metro Atlanta Urban Area Security Initiative, the Western Area Regional Radio System, and the City of Atlanta. And last but not least, the original design that we had uh, did not include a fire alerting system within the uh, the radio system, and that has been in, that has been included now, uh, and that uh, uh, TUSA will be monitoring the installation and the turn up of that system. So uh, they are requesting that a change order and the request of fifty thousand dollars be uh, approved. Uh, I support that, uh, and I think all of the other stakeholders uh, from Fire and EMS and EMOC and the Sheriff's Department would as well. Uh, this would be dollars well spent to ensure that the system is um, uh, exactly what we're looking for once the vendor completes the construction. Okay, any questions from the board, Commissioner? Well, you answered my first question. You're you're confident and and supportive of this of this change request. Uh, my recollection was that it was significantly higher. $97,000 was their first request. And we negotiated did, down to 50. So you negotiated down to 50. Yes, sir, we did. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Okay, Commissioner Geiger. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand. All this is due to something we have added to the system. Yes, ma'am. It was not in the original bid package. It was not. Increased scope of work. Because, you know, you, there were other bidders and everything. I just don't want to run into <coughs> problems there. No, ma'am. We wouldn't let that happen. All right. <coughs> okay. Commissioner. Thank you. you Commissioner Mitchell. <coughs> so I'm <coughs> glad that you negotiated it down, which is good. But did we lose anything in the negotiation? So what do we, what do we? We did not lose anything. Okay. We did not give anything away in the negotiation. Oh, okay. You just kind of had them in the headlock and just. I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. <laughs> I originally said we would not pay anything. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. Tough negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Any okay, other questions? Thank you, Director Peacock. Um, tab number 13, authorization to approve contract with terminus to serve as municipal advisor for Douglas County and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Holman? Yes. Um, we are asking permission or approval to engage uh, terminus services on a retainer contract. It would be $4,000 per month for duties mentioned in the contract, like the preparation of financial feasibility analysis on any new projects we have, um, any advice on overall rating strategies, uh, any advice on any of our overall financial controls, um, any advice or projects um, needed regarding any new projects, and they would um, have about 14 different things that they will provide. Um, we have used them, of course, as you know, for our SPLOST, um, we went for the SPLOST bond issue. Um, and speaking with them, it's just more effective and efficient for us to 
pay on a retainer than on a per project basis. It's more expensive on a per project. And we did have history of that. We had used, um, not it wasn't Terminus, it was another firm with uh, the Fox Hall uh, analysis. We had two analysis and you're looking at a project um, to that capacity of running anywhere between twenty to $25,000 per project. We're getting them on retainer regardless of however many projects we want them to look at um, or we need their advice or outside consulting um, expertise on, um, it would be included in that retainer. Um, and speaking with Madam Chair, one of the special projects um, that if this is approved that we would like for them to look at is to do a complete and thorough review of all of our tax abatements, um, the assistance with the master capital improvement plan, and any updates to the financial model that we have. Um, regarding the tax abatements, um, as you know, with GASB, we've been required to report it in the financial statements, but it's been more of a higher level review where I think what Madam Chair and Vice Chair talked about in the Finance Committee would be have them get down in the weeds, work with um, our development authority, work with the appraisal department and the tax commissioner's department, as well as my department, because it would help us with fulfilling our GASB uh, requirements to make sure that um, the abatements are um, being followed through with the rules when the abatements was given, make sure there's no money that's been left out on the table, um, and stuff like that. But this was just be one example of a project that we would have them do. So, this is good what we're asking. Do you have questions from the board? Uh, Commissioner Mulkey? Yeah, let me uh, ask a question on, on potential use here. And uh, first of all, I was, I was pleased with their work on our uh, financial uh, forecasting. Uh, processes as well as uh, oversight in the uh, uh, instrument panel, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but potential for you know possible future um, uh, public-private um, uh, initiatives. Let's just say uh, solar power you know, uh, in the. County partnering with Georgia Power and or Greystone uh, for a, uh, a solar power generation farm. Would they have the expertise and knowledge, in your opinion, uh, to take a financial uh, analysis of something like that and be able to project payback uh, time and, and so forth? Yes, um, they would actually. I'm glad you brought that up. They actually uh, helped us. I do an analysis um, on the uh, Amoresco uh, utility uh, savings um, agreement that we had a few, maybe a month okay. or so ago. So yes, they would have that expertise. Um, they um, have all kinds of different models and staff and um, resources that they have more readily available than just than what we do. So okay, let me ask, ask you another question related to that now. Uh, okay, let's say they're going to do, do an analysis on a, on a county uh, utility uh, generation form, solar generation. Uh, were they to need to require uh, additional, very specific expertise in, in solar generation? Uh, would that be uh, encompassed in their in their retainer, or will we, we have to pay an additional amount for that? Now, which would it be included? What, what is the reading of their contract? Well, it, here's what I think. I, I just I've read it. They are basically consultants, and so if it required some specific engineering science to come in, we would have to pay somebody to bring that. <coughs> the they would just analyze it for us because they have the capacity to analyze the data. And so I don't want to make this look like this is a panacea of all questions that may come out because that wouldn't be fair to them. They would analyze whatever numbers were generated by an expert mm -hmm. if it were something <coughs> way offline. Okay, good. I yield back. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions from the board commissioners? Thank you so much, Ms. Hallman. I see that Mrs. McDavid is here. Ms. McDavid, could you go to the podium? We just had two. Sure. We bypassed you and you were tab number nine and ten. So I'll just Commission. Uh, I'll start with nine. Authorization to submit the 2019 grant application for the family treatment court. <coughs> Would you like to tell us about this? 
Yes, this is our family dependency treatment court, um, drug court program for parents that are involved in deprivation courts. Um, I am still in the midst of writing the application, which is why I didn't get up here because mm -hmm. I was, uh, I forgot actually, I had this on the agenda. Um, there um, is matching funds required, but that comes out of my budget that I currently have. Okay. And I'm looking at about um, eighty to eighty-five thousand that I'm writing for. Eighty to eighty-five thousand. Let me answer my question. Okay. Any questions from the board of commissioners? But we will get a copy of the application once you get a chance to get around to it. Yes. Okay. All right. That, that that's what works for the process. Just okay. 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 Any other questions, Commissioner Mitchell? Um, I know you you're gonna absorb this in your budget to match. What is it? Is it five percent, ten percent, eighty percent? Uh, you have know? to match um ten percent. Ten percent. And, and that's in dollars and cents, or is that in work? It's a formula that they come up with. You divide actually the amount of funding that I'm requesting, which I haven't finished, so right. I can't tell you the amount other right. than I think it'll be around 80000 You divide it by nine, and that's our match. Okay, so it, it, there's a dollar amount coming out of your budget that will... Yes. Oh, is it in kind? Of it's an in kind match, yes. Oh, it's in kind of match? Yes. Okay. It's not additional funds that will be added to the budget. Okay, so gotcha. I yield back. Okay, do you have know other questions regarding it's number nine? Okay, we'll move on to tab number 10 authorization to submit an application for the fiscal year juvenile justice incentive grant in the amount of $160,000 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and uh, no matches required. That's correct. Um, this is from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council also. Um, the $160,000 is used to pay for services for kids that are delinquent kids that are coming through court. We offer um, functional family therapy, um, an art program, um, bot and life skills programs, and those um, things are, are done, um, actually are taught at um, the County Extension Office in the evenings. Any questions from the board? Thank you. Good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Sorry I was late. Um, yeah, I understand. <coughs> tab number 14, we'll just circle back to tab number 14. Uh, approval of, of a 206 lot preliminary plat for the Falconwood, Moccasin Point and Saddle Ridge pods of Anna Wake and Trail subdivision <coughs> of Highway 92 and 166. Director Worthington, please go to it. Thank you, Madam Chair. If it's okay with the board, I'm going to have uh, Ron Roberts, yeah, Ron Director as well. of uh, Fighting oh, Zone. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so this is actually um, Falconwood and Moccasin Point Saddle Ridge are the last three remaining pods in the Annaleke Trail subdivision. These, are, uh, these pods have uh, 206 lots and they occupy 119 acres of the total 714 acres. These lots are part of the original PUD C and therefore have a minimum lot size of 6,250 square feet. Minimum house size of 1,800 square feet of heated space. The property is located in land lots 99-115, first district, fifth section. Um, the owner and developer is LGI Homes and the uh, proposed preliminary plat is attached or sent for the, re for the reference. Um, the density change you'll notice is also from 1.98 to 1.83. Uh, we actually have Howard Ray representing LGI Homes here today as well if there's any questions. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? From Mr. Howard Ray. Commissioner Malkia. Whenever I hear density change, even though I think in this case it's, it's pretty uh, min minuscule, I, it always uh, piques my curiosity. Uh, what is the cause for the, the density change in this? This, this actually has a, um, uh, a long history. This, the, the density actually was changed. I think this thing was, was passed as a PUD C when I was five. So it's been around for a while. Wow. Well, I remember it. <laughs> okay. I was a little more than five. <laughs> um, Commissioner Mulcair, uh, what I would point out is that the original um, 
density for the what we're going to call Hannah Wake Trail east of the river was 1.98 or roughly it maintained the R2 designation okay so originally uh, the north half of the property was R2 the bottom half in the 70s was right. PUD yeah. so when they redid uh, updated the PUDC they basically sort of said we're going to cap that eastern half at a uh, density of 2 or 1.98 so where we're at actually for the holistic with this 206 okay. going in to the entire east side would come in at 183. Okay, so like so a to total recalculation. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. And so this pod by itself is 1.73. So it's not, it's also below the 198. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you? Yeah, the question will come in from the board. Okay. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Tab number 15, authorization to approve an agreement with GDOT in regard to a temporary designated truck detour route during the construction of the Highway 92 relocation project and I'll authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. This was tabled as well for 2018. Uh, Director Valentin. Yes, uh, this goes with the uh, public hearing that uh, you'll be conducting tomorrow and essentially is going to cover whichever one of the routes uh, you decide uh, on if okay. either one and uh, it is a confirmation that GDOT is responsible for maintenance of that route. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions from the board? I think you're good on this one. All right. Tab number 16, authorization of the purchase of Target Solutions training software in the amount of $20,000 to be funded through the SPLOS reimbursements from the City of Douglasville and the City of Delorica. Chief, Deputy Chief, Dr. Myers. This is a, uh, uh, good a good, a better, <laughs> 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 it's, a good <laughs> it's training that we do every month in our, um, in the stations, the guys will do it actually, they can log on to a computer and we can all get a certain amount of our training through the computer. And this is, a, like I said, this is an online kind of deal. Um, we have a, a group that does it now. It's, it's Moodle. This is a more advanced. It will actually keep up with our records so we turn into the state to redo our, or to uh, recertify for our EMT licenses, that kind of thing. Um, it'll help us with a, a lot of our uh, um, the necessary audit for the ISO audits and stuff. We'll already have our, all of our training stuff together when they get. It's at a cost of about 20000 and like I said, it's just to replace what the existing what we have now. It's a, it's a much better program. And the design of the stuff is uh, much easier for us. This is great. Any questions from the board commissioners? Thank you. Advancing technology is always good, so thank you. Tab number 17, authorization. This is for you as well, Deputy Chief. Approval to replace two thirds of the protective turnout gear in the amount of two hundred sixty-six thousand dollars to be funded through the SPLOS reimbursements from the City of Douglasville and the City of Villarica. Uh, Deputy Chief, this is to replace our turnout gear. We we try to keep each employee with two sets of gear. If we go out right now, we were to work a, a residential fire. Um, all the soot and, and toxins and stuff that get in the gear, we like to take them and wash them. Well, why it's being washed, they have to have something else to wear. And their reserve gear that they have now is out of date. So we'd like to replace it. Okay. How often are you updating this gear? Um, somewhere between five and 10 years, depending is, is what the gear manufacturer tells us to. But mm -hmm. some of our trucks are getting so busy now that we'll put a lot of wear and tear on the gear and some of it can be is three years, depending on the you know how active that firefighter is. And I think the last time we purchased was somewhere in the range of 13, 14, and 15. We did a third, a third, a third. Yes, yes. Um, and it might have been 14, 15, 16, but it was somewhere in that range. It was about five years ago. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the only problem, though, is that the, the time before that, when we bought this gear, that was the reserve gear that we're replacing, we bought it all at one time. Okay. So, okay. <coughs> any other questions for the board? All right. Thank you. Right. Well, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I have. To. Okay. I have one question. And yes, sir. Maybe two. So, um, 
This is the latest equipment that we're replacing it with. Is it the, like the latest and greatest, or is it just more of a this utility is functional? Um, no, we, we actually set up a committee, and we have the, the different companies come in. We look at their gear. Um, there's a several, the outer jacket, the inner jacket, and several things that we look at. Um, this is very functional gear. Um, we're asking you now, the, the, the last set we bought, but we're asking you now to approve this, and then we'll go out and bid it out. So we yeah, haven't, we bid, haven't bid, bid the gear out yet. And, and again, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm sensitive, but I'm a big proponent of equipment and, and making sure um, our first responders have what they need. So I don't know, I'm asking this question, just to, are we getting the right gear for them? Are we just trying to make it buy on a nickel? I mean, there's sometimes you-, you No, no, sir. We'll, okay. we'll, we want the best for our folks, so. I just, it's okay to say that. I just yes. need to hear it. Um, related to that, and, and this is my last question, just how, how many fires do we have on average? I'm just curious. how. How much exposure do we have annually, monthly? I don't know how you calculate it, but I'm just curious. Do we have a lot? I, our numbers have increased a lot um, in, in our residential stuff. Um, the commercial stuff is getting better with the new laws with the, the uh, uh, sprinkler heads and stuff are helping us a bunch. Um, we probably run, and, and this is a guess, I don't have the numbers with me. I know we ran, we're on the, it looks like we'll run about 18,000 calls this year. and probably 10% of those are actually structure fires. Mm -hmm. The bulk of what we do is medical, car wrecks, those kind of things. But uh, okay. but, it ha but it has, yes, it has increased from, like I said, I started here 30 years ago. Yes. And of course, in that 30 years, it's probably tripled the amount of structure fires we run now. All the homes <coughs> that were new back then are now got age on them. The wiring gets age on them and, okay. and things pick up. So it's not for the sake of density, because the newer homes, to your point, should be better. Or yes, should yeah. be, yes. But then we do make mistakes. <clears throat> I've got daughters at home that, you know, love to leave their curling irons on, so we have a brand new home and still have issues too, so. <laughs> and, and, and to that point, and then just related, um, to, to what extent do we educate the public? I mean, again, I, I think sometimes we take, not you, but we take for granted that the public knows, right? Because there's always a new generation, there's always new, right? And so, what do we do to educate? Um, um, I know there may be a um, uh, firefighters month, and there's awareness and stuff. But, but how how consistent are we in getting those simple messages that we assume everybody understands through common sense? <coughs> we curious. are very consistent as a department. We are interact a lot with the uh, uh, board of education. A lot of our kids, and, and one of the new SPLOS items we picked up this year was our fire safety house. But we also, in that same group, do a lot of stuff with businesses too. We have uh, uh, fire extinguishers training that we go out and do, um, those kind of things. So we're, we're, we're active, very active in, in the, that part of it. Smoke, smoke alarms. Yep, smoke alarms, yep. We give out smoke alarms to uh, folks within the county. We actually go out and install them too. We but, touch, high touch, we just don't yes, talk. We yes. go out and really, and, okay. Yep. Thank you. Are you? Thank you, sir. Questions for I have Dyer. a question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How long is a fire extinguisher good? When I built my house in 86, I put one on top of my freezer and I've never moved. <laughs> it's probably not any good. Not it it any just good. depends on the construction of, <laughs> of it. Um, <laughs> most of them are, are built, the bigger ones are built in and they'll have a gauge on them and they'll tell you when they lose pressure, but they recommend that uh, we, we check ours every three years. And, and let's you, you might want to check yours. So you better check. I don't know how to check it. So what does someone do if they have an old fire extinguisher? They think that they'll use it if they need to. So who checks it? How can we? You can bring it to your local fire station, and we'll check it. Okay, I'll see you. Well, okay. See you. <laughs> <laughs> we get that all the time. The uh, authorization to go out for being on same wording we always use on the side, which is number 17. Mm -hmm. <sighs> oh, authorization to be mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. All right, any other questions? You're on again, Deputy Chief. One more. One more. Uh -huh. Tab number 18, approval of the purchase of automatic vehicle locators, ADL, for mobile internet connectivity in the amount of $25,000 to be funded in SPLOSC reimbursements from the city of Douglasville and the city of Villarica. Deputy Chief. 
this is a program we started um, a couple of years ago. Our ambulances already have them, but it, our, we want them for our fire trucks too. And it interacts with the CAD system at 911, and it gives them one where we're at. They can locate us. They don't have to get on the radio and ask who's the closest to this fire. They'll be able to look on the screen and see us on the screen and know who's the closest. But on our end of it, it also gives us the ability to look at maps of the area with hydrant layers on them, um, any call history, if, if and it even interacts with the sheriff's department, if they go out and serve a warrant the day before and, and don't find who they're looking for, it'll pop up as a red flag and we can look and if we see, you know, this particular person that, you know, or this particular car, that we can call them before we enter in the building. So it's, it's a lot to do with safety and convenience for our 911 dispatcher. Okay, any questions from the board? Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Approval of uh, expenses. Uh, commissioners, just take a look at those for tomorrow, and then we will approve uh, these expenses tomorrow. Committee updates. We will now have our committee updates. We have the first update will be intergovernment committee, uh, inter intergovernmental committee, which is Commissioner Mitchell. So I'll, I'll come back to him. He's not in here. Okay. Uh, Parks and Recreation. Oversight committee, are you providing that for them? Yes, ma'am. I can do that. Yes. We ready? Yes. Uh, we brought several things before the uh, Recreation Oversight Committee in the last several months. Uh, I'll just go down the list. The first one was a recommendation to uh, let Alan Bell do our uh, design work for our restrooms and concession stands at Bill Art Park and uh, Fair Play Park, and that was approved. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second was uh, the one that's on the uh, agenda tomorrow is Sutton Architects. We brought that before them, and uh, if you so choose to approve that, uh, that was a recommendation to go before the commission. Uh, we had a security guard that was uh, actually uh, working for the drug court that was assigned there several uh, several years ago and we needed that uh, security guard in our parks so uh, the Recreation Oversight Committee recommended that that security officer be put back in the parks and we accomplished that. Uh, we also we had a, a question come up about jumping the citizens cars off in parks and uh, we brought uh, that before the Recreation Oversight Committee and before legal. And legal advised us uh, we should probably continue to do that. It was a, it was a good publicity uh, <coughs> idea. But before uh, we allowed any more of that, we actually sent our park security officers to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went to uh, the garage and they took a class on how to do that appropriately. So uh, we wouldn't damage any cars or any of our cars or any of our oh, personnel. <laughs> so uh, they accomplished that. They uh, they accomplished that, and uh, we'll continue to do that as we get new officers on. Uh, we established a Friends of the Park uh, committee, and we also have the Friends of the Park now on our website and people that want to sign up can go and pick a park or pick a section of a park or uh, a flower bed or whatever and uh, help us with maintaining that throughout the park system. And the last was we had a group come before us, uh, the Winston Knights. They're actually an offshoot of the Douglasville uh, recreation department and needed a place to play and they uh, requested the football field at Post Road Park mm -hmm. and it went before the oversight committee and that was approved so we will have a new football program playing at Post Road Park on Wednesday nights and that's, that's it that's our report um, I'll jump in. You mm -hmm. But but yes, yeah, so so the parks and recs have been busy, but what did you ask me? I'm sorry. I said, where's the organization out? Uh, no, no. Consulted to. No. But there is. Yes, there was. 
Okay, well, but they're softball. That, not, that's right. That's, that's football, but but this is football, it's not softball. <coughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, so yes, parks and recs are are uh, busy, and, and things are, are definitely moving. Uh, Intergovernmental uh, committee is uh, you know we're doing our usual. We we having conversations with those that need to be, but uh, right now there's nothing. There's no hot items. Uh, I would say there's no hot items. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> we'll okay. leave it right there. Uh, <laughs> technology. Oh, yeah, my friend Russell. Okay. Any, any any updates? I know we got some things going on, but I, I, you want to share with the with the team? Yes, yeah, so I just put together a few of the recent recommendations and, okay. and some of the things that we have pending. So, all right, some. The most recent formal uh, recommendation was for uh, moving forward with the 800 megahertz radio system mm -hmm. um, that went out, you know, obviously a few months ago. A couple things we're looking at uh, or considering uh, pending are a new queuing system for the Bleakley Tax Tag Office. I think we all had agreement on that at our last meeting, just looking for signatures to get that recommendation out. Uh, also, we discussed and are looking to put together recommendations for uh, officially funding piece of refresh as a vehicle for <coughs> delivering Windows 10 um, and then a potential conversion to Office 365 uh, for our all county employees. So, those are things we have before us right now. Well, um, we, we talked about 365 uh, at our last meeting, and it was very important as far as security for our computer system mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the judge was there judge Emerson was there and he is uh, he was relaying to us all the problems that not having oh, we're on Windows what is it we're on uh, 10 Microsoft Office version Microsoft yeah, Office. Exactly. and so that's causing a lot of problems with their new equipment that the right. uh, post that's office is getting in mm -hmm. and everything so um, <coughs> We can do it one or two different ways, but this was, we thought, the most uh, efficient, uh, although it is a least thing, but it's always updated. Mm -hmm. It is always updated, and you're never behind like we are now. And we've got so many systems out there now, right now, and uh, a lot of the new equipment just does not work right. And the security is a big issue, a big issue, especially with the, the judge, because he said we are vulnerable for being had. But, but I think, and Russell tested this, I think no matter how we go at this, we got to go at it some kind of way because if we don't, we'll always be behind and we get one piece of equipment that maybe to date and the other piece of equipment won't work because it's dated. So, I mean, but. Correct. Uh, and and the, one of the big security issues is Windows 7 will go out of support with Microsoft in 2020. That sounds like a long way out, but we have over 600 computers deployed right now with. Windows 7. Yeah. So if we don't start the process now of updating right. that, we'll really be behind the sticks <coughs> in 2020 when that becomes a huge security threat. Right, right. So. And even if we went to the Windows 16, we'd be updated in a few months. So right. it's just always uh, a technology, problem. Technology is, we'll do, is a non-stop. And, and I'm glad we got our friend down there to just kind of keep us abreast and, and keep everybody on, on uh, focus on that. Yes. Can I say one, yes, one yes, other yes. thing uh, is about the refresh. Uh, this is where we would place the uh, computers in the courthouse uh, uh, in an incremental way so that we don't have to replace them all at one time. And uh, we stopped it uh, year before last? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And so we need to. Last year. It's going last to year. Yeah, last year was the first year we did not fund it. Yeah. We did not fund it last year, so. It's not funded mm -hmm. again this year, Correct. and this is something. <coughs> if you um, get behind in technology, you're going to have to mm -hmm. hire more people, well, really. Mm -hmm. And and so this is uh, something badly needed, so that we're all be on the same page. Yes, I agree. And last year, mm -hmm. yes, yes, I think everybody agrees. I think even with these tablets we got, so it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> yes, it's okay. coming. <laughs> so just <laughs> FYI. Uh, anything else? Do we miss the name? Uh, that's all I have. Right. Thank you again. And last but not least, uh, programming. Uh, Rick, I don't know if you want to share all the great things that are happening in, in the programming and EC23 and all the other great things going on there. Sure. Good morning, Chairman, <laughs> Commissioners, and everyone. Um, a lot of things uh, are, are happening, uh, but 
you know, to begin, just to give an update regarding the online voting um, system for the Board of Commissioners. Uh, there's a little glitch in terms of software program with the company we were dealing with. We figured what that problem was regarding the software of Chrome that's going to be installed. We expect to be back online. Technology, see, it's changing. So, <laughs> so, okay. yes. We expect to, sure, sure. Right. We expect to be back online tomorrow. Right. Uh, tomorrow's meeting, just to give you an update regarding that. Um, we've been working actively to increase and elevate the profile of Douglas County uh, in ways through our communications and community relations department. We just recently completed uh, an event uh, we organized in celebrating uh, Alana Myers Taylor, our US Olympian from Douglas County, uh, where the governor came and delivered some remarks. Uh, you know, we also were able to collaborate and include, uh, as I should say, uh, our schools, uh, children. The national anthem was sung by Alexander High School, uh, their mastery course. Uh, we also had Douglas County High School's drumline escort her in as well uh, through the parade. Uh, we've been... Uh, well, you, you also had uh, City TV. <laughs> yes. Another big piece of uh, collaborative effort that goes on, so yes. Absolutely, absolutely. We uh, collaborated from the very beginning with uh, the City of Douglasville to pull this off, um, you know, using you know, their resources, our resources, uh, production meetings beforehand to um, work on completing. Uh, we've been held a news conference uh, to allow um, Alana to address, you know, the media and questions, uh, you know, regarding whether she would compete as well. Uh, for my department, we elevated the use of social media as well. Um, you know, just, you know, as of yesterday, uh, when there was a severe weather, you know, alert, you know, we were able to notify uh, members of the, the public um, who even made remarks, you know, on Facebook, such as, you know, this is why, you know, I live here in this area. I'm glad to get this information quickly. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's happening as well. We are in the process of writing a script for our first <coughs> SPLOS up to the minute update. So you'll be seeing that on the air very soon, uh, hosted by Commissioner Mitchell uh, and David Good, communications manager. Uh, really communicating uh, to the public exactly what's going on with the SPLOS funds and the uh, projects. So uh, that's uh, happening as well. And I guess I'll just last but not least, I mean, they might already know this, but the hiring of uh, the young lady that uh, was a part of your team. And, and, and I don't know if we shared that maybe other meetings, but I think we probably should at least I guess everybody knows she's there, but yeah. sure, sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, new in our department uh, is our communications and media specialist Lena Hardy. Uh, we uh, she's been on last couple months, um, you know, shooting, editing uh, projects, our district dialogue projects uh, as well, uh, other you know programming uh, items. Yes, uh, outside of that, I think uh, that's our report for all three of those committees, and uh, all is good in the county. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next, we have a uh, finance committee uh, report, uh, Commissioner Robinson. All right. Very good. I have that. As opposed to what we did, we're going to sort of give some, uh, some insight into what we plan to do. We have a finance committee today at 2 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of items, obviously this is a public meeting, but there's a, um, two or three items that I just want to bring up. Jennifer, you want to hit 2, 3, and 4? Two, three, 3, 4, and 5. The meetings? Yeah. Yes. Um, we're going to have four bonds uh, this time last year and um, Moody's and I'm waiting on S&P to probably do their annual review um, but we received the final Moody's uh, review their annual comment on Douglas County um, I'll pass that out um, for right now I have to get Moody's permission to, uh, to share this publicly so I just ask that y'all just keep it 
um, to yourselves until I get the authorization that I can uh, distribute it and make it available through open records. But it's just a um, report on the review of Douglas County where we stand since we issued the bonds. And as you can see, um, they still give us, you know, the double A2 uh, rating. So. Very good. Yes. Yep. Very good. In addition, we're going to talk about the um, in today's meetings, talk about the 2000, uh, 2018 um, budget improvement um, request is going to be revisited today. So I look forward to seeing what's presented. Um, in addition, we have on the agenda to talk about um, a sheriff's department incentive uh, regarding applications and applicants and how to get them in. Uh, we look forward to that. Um, and then we've got one more, Jennifer. Uh, excess fund. Yes, we're going to be uh, reviewing a draft of the excess fund balance policy that was brought before y'all a meeting or so ago mm -hmm. about um, how to, if, once we meet our 10% or if we want to go up to 15%, the excess above that, we can set money aside into a committed fund balance for capital. Since we rely so much on um, squalced, we want to be able to have another funding source and be able to set money aside. So we'll be going over that draft um, extension of our fund balance policy or addition to our fund balance uh, policy and uh, bring a recommendation to the full board within the next month of what, that, what we feel like the recommended policy should be. Very good. That, that's it for today's meeting. So I'm going to go ahead um, and shift over to transportation. Gary? Okay, just highlight a couple of the ones we're going to talk about. Um, and tomorrow's meeting at 2 o'clock. So yes. both of these are back-to-back -back finances today at 2 p.m. Um, public meeting and so is tomorrow at 2 p.m. From the, the multimodal standpoint, we have three items that we'll be discussing tomorrow. Uh, one is will be a recommendation uh, asking for the full Board of Commissioners to authorize a grant application with the Federal Transit Administration. This will be for $240,000 uh, with a $60,000 local match for uh, furniture and equipment to go in the addition to the Transportation Center. and that, that won't have any impact on the county budget because that particular project is already in my 2018 budget. Um, also, sort of related to that, um, I have the, the final drawings and the uh, architect's rendering of the outside, the exterior of, of the new addition and how it's going to fit in with our existing building. I'll be presenting that to the committee uh, tomorrow for their review and then Hopefully, we'll get the recommendation to submit that to the full board of commissioners also. And then the third item we'll have tomorrow is, well, I'll have an update on our negotiations uh, with the collaborative firm regarding our, our, our branding and public outreach project. Uh, we had a negotiating meeting with uh, the collaborative firm last <coughs> week. It went real well. And right now they're in the process of putting together their, their scope of work and, and price for those projects. And we'll talk about that tomorrow as well. Very good. Thank you. Miguel, you want to add anything to the broader? Um, yes. We'll be talking tomorrow about uh, the BIRs as well. And uh, we're going to be revisiting the status of the Route 90. Uh, sorry. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, we're going to be revisiting uh, the, uh, the status of the Lee Road widening uh, project. Uh, that's moving uh, along toward getting closer and closer to being able to be uh, deemed uh, ready for construction. However, uh, we're tracking the funding uh, on that. Um, and I think that's uh, all of the items that we've had. And, and yeah, that's sufficient enough. Thank you, Miguel. And just one final thing is that we are meeting with a citizen group tomorrow as part of our um, um, hear their comments regarding um, transportation, uh, specifically um, the bus services. So that is on our agenda tomorrow as well, time permitting. I yield on here. Okay. <coughs> Next, we have committee reports from uh, Commissioner Mulcair, and he has three reports. We omitted one, and not by mistake, but it's a newer uh, committee. 
and uh, we just uh, didn't add it, but we will add it uh, for our future updates. Uh, Benefits Committee, uh, Commissioner Amoke, you have Pension Advisory Board and the Public Safety Committee. So yeah. if you would uh, elaborate on those, please. Yeah, I didn't prep for the Public Safety, but I'll, I'll uh, make up something. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask uh, Director uh, uh, Perry to go ahead and come to the podium. He and I will do a little kind of a little give and take on the uh, latest uh, benefits committee uh, meeting, which was uh, in uh, in last month. Uh, we did an, uh, an enrollment overview uh, and uh, had pretty good marks. Uh, good response, good remarks. Uh, we had several. Uh, Public, I say public input, employee input yes, meetings that were fairly well attended. Uh, we had uh, uh, quite a few few of those meetings, and uh, very very few people. Um, excuse me, most people did the online enrollment. They did, and I did not. I came into the office because I wanted to sit through the actual process of sitting down with an agent or with a representative of our uh, consultant and actually enrolled online, sitting with somebody, so I had a better understanding of it. Um, very simple, straightforward, uh, and uh, we're looking look again looking forward to 2019. Uh, we, we will look, do an analysis of a potential uh, new health care provider. I don't yes. think there's any there's not any broad dissatisfaction with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. But just like you know hiring an auditor or or whatever, it's good to just kind of look at where you are. Uh, and uh, see if there's uh, some better possibilities out there for health care uh, for Douglas County employees. Uh, another thing that was enlightening, and I'm going to give you your chance here in a second, uh, uh, Frederick. Go right ahead. Uh, <laughs> the uh, emergency room usage continues to be a problem in that uh, people are going to the emergency room for things that are really not emergencies. Uh, you know, head colds. Uh, sometimes you know just back ache, uh, tummy ache, that kind of thing, and uh, could really best be handled by if they had a, a personal care, uh, a personal physician. And also, unfortunately, what a lot of people do is that rather than have a, a personal care physician, uh, they go to the, go to the emergency room. So a year ago, we increased the deductible on that. Uh, it's I can't say that we're satisfied with the result thus far. You can chime in, uh, Frederick. So we want to give it another year. Would you talk right. a little bit about emergency room usage? Yes, and um, we added a co-insurance to that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's a little bit more expensive to utilize that emergency room benefit. We found that that was one of the more expensive uh, benefits that we offer that the uh, employees are utilizing. And MSI has been able to track that, and they've shown us that some of the visits, majority of the visits are kind of frivolous, so uh, mm -hmm. as, as Commissioner uh, mentioned. So we added that to uh, to uh, really try and help the employees more so understand that uh, that they have other options available to them. And one of the bigger things we've been trying to accomplish is to get our employees to establish a relationship with their primary care physician. So it's moving a little slow, but it's moving in the right direction. So uh, we're uh, emergency room, at least the frivolous use of the emergency room uh, is down. Yeah, right. Inappropriate use, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you to touch on something else too, uh, which uh, I think is, I'm going to say this, it's underutilized for sure, and that is our, our live health online usage, being able to sit down and, and visit with the doctor online. Yes, and uh, and I think we have uh, actually some personal experience here with uh, with Jennifer. Uh, would you touch on that? Uh? Yes, and we're trying to highlight that benefit to uh, to let our employees know that um, that that is an option as well as emergency uh, uh, the emergency care uh, after hours care is an option as opposed to the emergency room. We've been trying to do a little bit more education as far as that uh, the live health on, live health online is concerned. We have a uh, benefits expo that will be coming up uh, in June, and we'll make sure that we highlight that benefit as well. Uh, we did some um, some uh, campaigns surrounding that uh, live health online, um, and uh, it, it it caught on somewhat. But uh, with that benefit, it's just something that we have to continuously uh, to promote. 
to our employees. So, uh, so we'll make sure that we continue in that effort. And again, I say that we have a benefits expo that will be coming up in June, and we'll make sure that we highlight that benefit. Okay, and to, and to reemphasize this uh, live health online, you're actually you're you're actually meeting with with a doctor. Mm -hmm. There is an app that you have to download on your smartphone, mm -hmm. and uh, you can actually, you will actually do a, if you're familiar with FaceTime, you will do a FaceTime with a doctor. So you will log into that uh, applic application. <coughs> application will let you know what doctors are available, and uh, you will select one of those, and uh, the doctor comes on, and you begin to, uh, to proceed with a one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one meeting with that doctor. You can actually select a specific doctor. Yes, sir. If need be, uh, that's uh, oh, and a reduced deductible, a smaller deductible with the yep. online. Mm -hmm. Is it ten dollars? It is. 10 15? It's fifteen dollars, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yes, okay. sir. So it's, it's a great tool for employees, and so we're working on ways to to uh, promote that. Uh, I think I'm gonna give it a try next time. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let me see. Uh, I think that about covers it. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything you wanted to add? Because you're on the safety committee. No, I think, you know, what you pointed out was the good points about the FaceTime and the doctor, and it will let you know the wait times. Yeah, absolutely. If you mm -hmm. choose any doctor, it will let you know how long you have to wait. Mm -hmm. And it's been very well received. It's just yes. we need to get the usage up. The people that have used it had no complaints. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we might have to get some testimonials mm -hmm. from our employees who mm -hmm. utilized it. Mm -hmm. Just to put it out there, so employees, if they see that some of their colleagues are utilizing, they're more apt to uh, to utilize that benefit as well. Okay, if you'll stay up there, I'm going to ask Jennifer to step up to the podium, mm -hmm. so we're on camera and on mic, uh, because the, both of these uh, folks are on our our pension uh, committee, and uh, a lot of news all the time on, about pensions uh, nationally and the debt that's being. Uh, uh, attributed to uh, pension. Part of it is, uh, I say a large part of it is real, a large part of it is also uh, how you have to report uh, your pension liability. Uh, and so what we did in our last meeting, we had the um, uh, YEPCOR, which is a, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, came in with their uh, actuary, I think from St. Louis, if, if I recall correctly, yes. and kind of gave us a health checkup on our program. Uh, yes, we have significant uh, liability as most, most uh, jurisdictions do and most companies do. And uh, the, uh, I guess I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer to kind of touch on the accounting aspects at a very, at a very high level and what's sure. changed over the last couple of years in terms of uh, pension liability. Sure. Um, GASB, uh, which is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, has uh, created different um, requirements that we have to report or use different assumptions that we have used in the past, or the actuarials have to use, or actuaries have to use different actuarial assumptions, uh, and that has caused um, a greater contribution uh, to the plan that we experienced last year. Um, the uh, different mortality or yeah, mortality tables had to be used um, and different assumptions regarding the interest rate and you wouldn't think a quarter of a percent of interest rate would matter that much but when you go from assuming a seven and a half percent interest rate down to a seven and a quarter you know because of the way the market they try to smooth everything out um, it does impact the contribution um, and the liability on the books and that's nationwide it's not just pertains to Douglas County it doesn't just pertain to Georgia it pertains to anybody that has a defined benefit plan um, and has to go through these standards that's in the government entity so we have experienced that um, we did see that ACCG uh, Commissioner Mitchell is on that advisory board um, they did decide that because they started seeing the trends of the uh, funding levels go down because of these actuarial assumptions it wasn't that counties or entities were not putting in enough money it was just that the liabilities were growing therefore the rule funding, changed, yeah. yeah the rule changed therefore the funding ratios uh, changed but they did decide to go from an 80 percent funding level down to 75 and we're just around the 77 percent mark mm -hmm. um, and probably they couldn't they didn't want to um, 
promise anything, but they said because of the contribution that we made last year that they see that we're going to, our contribution rate or our funding ratio is going to be um, higher than what it was for uh, last year. Inadequate. Inadequate, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's never been in jeopardy. Let me make yeah. that very clear that, you know, coming before y'all last year to ask for the additional increase, it wasn't because the pension plan was in jeopardy or anything. It was just we budgeted a certain amount based on prior trends and because of all these rules that changed, it significantly impacted not just ours, but anybody that was in that plan or had a government plan, they saw an increase in their contribution and so we just felt like it needed to be brought before the Board of Commissioners to amend the budget. And uh, Director Perry, I'll have you finish up. I was just make a comment on the pensions. Uh, Delta Airlines was uh, close on to, uh, in, in its bankruptcy like all airlines did, uh, disposing of their, of their pension pension program because of, of IRS laws and the fact that this all this pension money uh, liability has to be recognized I think it would at that time like in within a short time frame like two or three years which is really doesn't make a lot of sense <coughs> likewise our pension liability because we're not paying that pension out in, in the next two or three years but that's what the airlines are required to do and then so through Congress they extended that payout period like I think 17 years which allowed uh, a lot of the airlines, Northwest and others, to, to maintain the pension rather than mm -hmm. throwing it to the government, pennies on the dollar, to be funded. Mm -hmm. So, so likewise, uh, we certainly have a, a, a pension issue, yeah. like practically all municipalities, uh, counties do, uh, and uh, states. Uh, but we're, we're going to continue to monitor it and going to uh, long-term financial viability. Uh, and we're talking about uh, long-term capital funding and that sort of thing. It's something we're going to have to develop a formula uh, so that we reduce that uh, that pension liability. Uh, uh, Frederick, do you want to add anything? Well, I just want to say that that uh, that meeting that we had, we're we're going to do that on an annual basis. We're going to have the board to come in and just give us a, a, a checkup on our pension plan. Let us know where we are. Let us know if any uh, changes that are going to be coming down the uh, pipeline that will affect our pension plan negatively or positively, and uh, we'll be doing that on an annual basis. I do want to add that uh, as this week, the 22nd, we'll have GEPCOR to come in. Uh, they'll be in Citizens Hall. They'll be talking about our pension plan, just going over our pension plan. Yeah, thank you. And talking about, um, you know, how benefits are calculated, how they're distributed, and they'll be also talking about the offset that uh, applies to Douglas County employees. Okay, okay, we're so going to get that word out, or I have already got that word We out. have been sending emails out as well. Okay, very good. Yes. Right. Well, thank you both uh, for the day and for your service on these committees. Thank you. Thank you. Now, on the uh, Public Safety Board, I'm going to call on uh, Madam Chair to pitch in. Okay. Because she's also also on the committee. What, we, what the county has established is basically mm -hmm. a, uh, 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 I guess, a... Uh, Stakeholders in the interest of public safety, the, the city, uh, fire, EMS, uh, the uh, sheriff's office, uh, some other entities, and then uh, trans transportation uh, as, as required and communications uh, as required in that regard. Uh, that's the first thing that's happened that's important. Is we, we're putting all these entities in the room at the same time to discuss public safety <coughs> issues. Uh, we've reviewed our, our uh, existing ordinance as it relates to public safety and have found no deficiencies there. We feel like they're, it, it's a, adequate a, as is. Um, we also discussed the 911 uh, funding and that's that's up before the state house right now and what the implications are there for, for public safety. I think the biggest thing that's on, on most people's minds, at least currently, is uh, the school shooting and specifically what we can do to be proactive in training our, not just our law enforcement first responder staff, uh, but also the school system. So this, uh, our, our membership in this board is going to be reaching out, interfacing, and uh, having some exercises with the school system uh, to proactively train uh, school staff <coughs> in particular uh, on how to handle these, these kind of situations. Uh, Madam Chair, anything that you'd like to add to that uh, public safety aspect? Yeah, I just want to quickly add that we are, our, our primary goal is to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there to improve our um, public safety, such as active shooter, uh, mass casualties, uh, has, has met, so we have several 
several components, I believe, uh, that our group that we can host is very talented and they have the ability and the, the knowledge and expertise to, to pull a plan together. We're also working with the city and also Major Holmes is uh, representing the Sheriff Department and he has actually approached me about this committee and I thought that it would be a great idea, particularly what's going on yep. with the school mm -hmm. shooting and then also we want to make sure that we're aligned with our public school system to make sure that uh, this meet, uh, committee is very productive. But with that, with no further ado, I'll ask you if you could, uh, Major Holmes, just uh, add to what we're doing and what you already uh, established with the school system thus far. Yeah, we have had um, a couple of meetings since we last met with the Public Safety Committee about getting the participation. We're going to have a meeting uh, tomorrow, a subcommittee meeting. That, uh, we'll probably have the location, we'll have the, the if not the day, the week of it, um, and trying to uh, see how many volunteers we can get to do this. Um, the Sheriff's Office, historically, for the last three years that I know of, has done uh, preventive active shooter training. We do it with our SROs every year. And when they have the ability, when it's a summertime or when it's a holiday, they try to do something. Well, uh, a few years ago, there was a, a uh, training that went on at Alexander High School. This is what we're wanting to do this summer is one of a magnitude that's going to include us, the city police department. The fire department, the hospital, um, and uh, school system, emergency management, um, to include a mass casualty type scenario. So we're going to do volunteers, um, and uh, I should know more by the end of this week about the dates and times of that. Um, and uh, I, I know that it's probably going to be in the week of July, probably middle to latter part of July when. The uh, SROs already have a week scheduled for training. We're going to pick one of those days to do this operation. So um, we're, I hope to know more by the end of the week on that be some more finalized. I'll let y'all know as soon as I do. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Our next committee uh, update is uh, Commissioner Guider on fire and EMS. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And I'm going to yield to uh, Deputy, Chief Deputy uh, Scott Zach. Thank you. Um, we've met three times since the last update. As a result of the meetings, we had uh, five recommendations. The first one was uh, to award extreme images, the, uh, the bid for installation of the signage for the stations and the wrap for the fire safety house. The next one was uh, the remaining balance of the 2002 SPLOS fund to put it all together so we can uh, finish our metal building at the fire training complex. Um, recommend next one was to purchase an additional station logo for our Winston station. Because of the roundabout and the construction, we're actually going to be turning around and going through the bays the other way to the outside, so we need to sign for each side of the station. So we had to uh, amend that. Um, the three ones that I talked to today, uh, about the target solutions, uh, the turnout gear, and the AVLs for the fire trucks. That was a recommendation. And then uh, another one was to provide the fire department with eight additional positions for manpower <coughs> on our ladder trucks um, uh, to help uh, bring down the overtime cost. It's pending review of the commissioner. And then the splosh equipment, the sploshed equipment that we bought in 17. Uh, of course, the, the ladder truck, the ambulance, um, we've taken deliveries on both of those. The ladder truck's actually in service. Uh, we're waiting on some more pieces for the ambulance. Um, the pumper is scheduled to be delivered sometime this week. And then we've talked about the radio system. Uh, the bids were actually uh, awarded to Motorola and the work that's been done on it. And that's it. Okay, Mr. Guy. Yes, uh, I just want to elaborate a little bit about the uh, recommendations for the eight uh, new positions. Each year, for many years, uh, as the county has grown, there's always been a request for additional staff and different uh, additional staffing. And usually those are the first things cut, is the additional staffing. And so we've really gotten behind. Yes, um, in the neighborhood, I, I think y'all recommendation was 40 new people <laughs> yes, and there's no way we can do no, that uh, so that. we've got to have a plan uh, out there to replace uh, I mean to fill uh, the gaps oftentimes um, 
we may have to shut a truck down because of uh, not enough staffing. And we, we want to at least get ladder trucks uh, staffed where they have, uh, is it three? Yes, ma'am. Two or three. I can't three. remember. We went back and forth. But uh, this is just uh, the first step. Mm -hmm. And we just need to grow with the county and to fill the positions. The overtime it amounts to about a million dollars a year. Yeah, almost a million dollars a year. And so that will give us uh, these eight, eight people. Yes. Uh, so uh, we're hoping that it will. Uh, it may not do it all, right? Uh, county committee. Uh, no. It, <laughs> well, as far as the eight people, I think it was about half of it. About half of it. Yeah. Yes. But it will be offset by the uh, overtime. Yes, according to the fire chief, yes, it will be. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else, Chief? Okay. Any other questions, please? Mm -hmm. All right. Last but not least, we have a safety update. And um, well, I am good. the appointee from the Board of Commissioners, but I will yield to <laughs> our director, Laverne, good Matt Laverne, if you could take and yes, respond to what we've been doing. Yes, ma'am. Good morning and thank you. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chairman, um, the, uh, um, the safety board has met um, um, on a monthly basis. Uh, every month with uh, the exception of this past January where we were unable to meet due to not having a quorum. Um, or in, um, two of us, uh, or three, two out of three of the investigators were uh, out in the field that day and uh, unable to make it to the meetings. Um, with that being said, the, um, the safety board has continued to work on the safety manual, which I'm pleased to announce that as of this uh, past Friday, it was sent to the printer for a proof copy, which is a final copy uh, with um, edits from 18 different departments that were submitted along with the galley copy. Uh, so we're really um, happy about having this brought to that next stage. And we'll have those available uh, sometime next week. But unfortunately, it'll, um, next week is also the next safety board meeting. So it'll be uh, after this coming meeting when we are able to get them to them. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we have also, um, I'm getting over something with my throat, so excuse me, it's um, scratched. Um, we have also been working on uh, redo, um, ways that in which we present uh, to the safety board at present. It's pretty paper heavy. Uh, so we are, are trying to streamline that with some technology. Um, we are also working on the uh, risk and safety's webpage, and I will be bringing some ideas of ways that we can continue to provide superior services, uh, both as a support department um, to uh, internal uh, departments, as well as our external customers. Um, we have also discussed a RMIS system, Risk Management Information Systems, uh, to include all the forms and all the advantages of moving uh, claims management and all that we do onto one platform. Um, we will be having a presentation, it's my understanding, <coughs> this Tuesday um, on uh, cleats. Uh, there are attachable cleats that hikers use that can prevent slips and falls during ice and snowstorms. Um, it's just something that an employee will be presenting to us, and we'll see what the, um, the safety board has to think about um, those attachable cleats for those unique situations. But there are some risks that come, in, that come along with them. Um, and lastly, um, we have also been working on, um, I've been putting together a waiver plan on speaking to the safety board tomorrow about it. It is something, uh, it's a waiver for using, helping people unlock car doors or help them, uh, or for um, uh, jump starting vehicles. Um, it is my understanding that Parks and Recreation is getting into uh, assisting people with jump starting those vehicles and Risk and Safety has worked with Fleet Management to put together a safety class where uh, employees have been trained to do that. Uh, in the past, the uh, Sheriff's Department had used a tan 
had used a tangible waiver form um, to reduce uh, um, as a risk reduction technique to reduce our liability when assisting those out in the field uh, or our customers I should say. Um, the same goes for jump starting vehicles or un helping them unlock them. Um, um, but at present, the Sheriff's Department is using uh, their body cameras to do it verbally to gather uh, that authorization. So um, we're just trying to help Parks and Rec with, uh, with that waiver and uh, any other department that assists our external customers with those needs. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. With that being said, are there any other questions or concerns from the board of commissioners? At this time, um, Attorney Bernard, do we need to go to executive session? We have one matter under personnel for executive session, Madam Chair. We'll take a few minutes. Okay. Um, we have one matter for executive session. At this time, board, uh, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion is approved. I'll take a ten minute break and we'll go come back back. Yeah. Yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you all again. Um, the executive session has ended and we're back along. With you. Any other comments or questions from the board commissioners or from our administrator? <coughs> Madam Chair, uh, one of the issues has come up. Uh, from a structural standpoint, it is the uh, when Judge Devery's retirement from state court, he had a law clerk there that uh, shared duties with Judge Barker, who's now the chief uh, state court judge, that is leaving going to private <coughs> practice. And in noting as they fulfill that job, that job historically has only been handled by one person. She had a law degree, and not yet when she first started part time for the county, passed the bar. We recommend from the Labor Department at the judge's request that the position be modified. It still will be called a law firm, but it will have a requirement that you graduate from accredited law school and that you pass successfully the Georgia State Bar and are a member in good standing with the Georgia State Bar. So we would ask y'all, as part of new business tomorrow, to consider a modification in the structure of that position as we consider a replacement tomorrow recommended by the state court judge. And amend the budget. And amend the budget accordingly. Okay. Uh, so those, have those would be a dual item as new business, and I will get with Ms. Watson to make sure it's on the agenda properly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? You get with that, Judge Watson. Yes, and I don't know. I, I think my only concern <coughs> is that uh, there's been some. We, we just don't want to call it something that would confuse whether they work here or work for y'all. I don't think it matters what okay. it's called. It's just what, as long as what it gets the paid right. <laughs> and, the, and the responsibility, right. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, so we'll, we'll, we'll see that tomorrow or what that looks like, right? It'll be on new business tomorrow. New business. Can, can we, how, how long would it take us to get that, though? The job description? So yes. <coughs> we, we have worked uh, extensively with St. Gita, so we have that. Uh, the updated job description, we made all the necessary adjustments to it. We're just going to make that uh, that change with the title, mm -hmm. and then uh, then we can email it out to the commissioners. Okay. Can, we, can we get that prior to? Yes, like, sir. Yeah, today or something? Yes, sir. We're going to go down and make that change and email it out. Good. Good. And, Mark, <coughs> have you seen the proposed change other than yes. the title? Okay. Yes. And you're okay with it? Yes. Okay. We've done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Comments from the Board of Commissioners. And with that being said, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.